Hello, you're listening to Otaku Spirit Anime Cast. My name is Andrew, and I am joined here with Chris. Yo. How are you feeling, Chris? I don't know. I'm missing out on shows. You're Andrew's <laughs> fault. I feel so bad for Chris right now because I know he so badly wants to watch shows all the time and he can't. Life sucks. Yeah. Especially when you want to watch your cute anime girls. Right? You have to prioritize that point. You're a normie. Chris has become a normie. It's time for everybody to revolt. <laughs> the patrons <laughs> leave. <laughs> they don't like us anymore because Chris is becoming a normie. But no, we are here. I have dragged Chris into this room. I've told him, if you're if you're going to pass out, just let me know. And we'll stop. We're going to try to get through as many fall 2022 anime reviews as possible. Because, yes, we did want to get the deliberations for the best of out of the way first. And so, oh, yeah, that's right. We still got to talk about everything that happened with fall. And um, since I haven't done like reviews for everything on my YouTube, on the YouTube channel, it's going to be the first time people get to hear about our thoughts on these shows. So we got a lot to go through, obviously, because fall was a big season. So we should probably jump right into it. As usual, from otakuspear.com, you can go there for all of our links, social media links, ways to support us. And yes, our Discord links, so you can join our fantastic community of people and talk about anime. So with that said... Let's jump into the fall 2022 anime season reviews. We'll see how many we can get through. Um, you'll know based on the timestamps and all that kind of stuff in the description. So our first one is Mobile Suit Gundam, The Witch from Mercury. This one was run by or created by Sunrise, obviously, because it's Gundam. Um, we have Hiro, uh, Hiro, Hiroshi Kobayashi, who did Kizniver and Spriggan, a series composition by Ichiro Okuchi, who did Kogias Akito and Akito the Exiled. And Covenant the Iron Fortress, as well as Skate Infinity. So, and this one, oh, wow, God, where do I start with the story? <laughs> like most Gundams, it has that whole aspect of people on Earth, people in space. At some point, you have this kind of conflict between both the people of the Earth and people of space. Uh, Spatians don't like the Earthians because they're, you know, staying behind on Earth, whereas the Earthians hate the Spatians because they're polluting the Earth and they left it, um, all that kind of stuff. But our main focus goes in on. A certain Benaret group, and the Benaret group is a group that was formed and pretty much took over the production of mobile suits um, at some point in the pre, uh, prologue story. We get an idea that there was this one group that was creating Gundams, which used this Gund arm uh, technology, which is like a prosthetic technology. It's able to kind of tap into your mind so that you can control a, a ligament or something like that, an arm or a leg. And they didn't like the gun arm technology because it was essentially being used in mobile suits to be able to control it better, but it was harming the pilot. So under the guy, we all know why they did it, but under the guise that it's harming pilots and killing pilots, they decided to outright ban it. And in the prologue, we see that they not only banned it, but they went in secretly and pretty much wiped out the facilities of people. Cut forward in time. Again, we have the Bennett group pretty much controls all the mobile suit control or development. And there is a school that is run by the Bennett group and we have a girl named Sueta Mercury that joins that school, and she has ties with a certain individual that was a part of that organization that got wiped out in years past. And yes, Sueta Mercury has a Gundam, <laughs> and they're trying to f cover the fact that it is a Gundam. And so obviously everybody's like, oh, wait, this is a Gundam. This shouldn't exist. And so they're trying to look into it. And we have pretty much the polls and uh, background deals being made if they want the existence of the Gundam there with the gun format. Is it using the gun format? And uh, basically all these different powers within the Benaret group trying to pull more weight inside the organization and the development of the better mobile suit and stuff. So, And yeah, Sweta Mercury goes to the school. She ends up meeting Miorin, who is actually the daughter of the head of the Benaret group. And they get to form a little bond there, and eventually they decide to create their own company and whatnot and yeah I guess, I guess as far as i want to go with it <laughs> it's a lot of stuff in there what was your thoughts on mobile suit gundam the moe gundam I didn't with get, cutesy I, girls this was one of the ones that i dropped how far did you get into it um i want to i know for a fact it was after the founding of their their little business and i want to say it was like two episodes after that um so you got pretty far into it then you were you're pretty close to finishing it off then before everything happened. Pretty much. <laughs> I I mean, everything everything pretty much shut down at the end of November. So I was I'm actually surprised that you even started it because this is kind of one of those ones where it's like Gundam is 
at least for Chris now, is like a no-no because obviously Gundam eventually gets dark. Yeah, eventually it gets dark. I mean, it did technically have that feel early on, obviously. Mm -hmm. This cutesy version of... The, the, this one was it, it did feel very unique in the fact that it does have the like you like Andrew was kind of joking about the kind of moe esque feel to it. And I do like that about it. It it has this kind of not exactly cute girls doing cute things, but it, in a way it, it's it's a, a Gundam twist on the cute girls doing cute things. And and it, and and as weird as that sounds, that that's how I feel watching this is. When when you see Suleta, she's kind of this gambate, but at the same time she has that um, boche bochi um, kind of timidness, timidness, and and so it kind of works uh, for her. And and then you have, um, of course, Miora and Miora, bleh, the um, the bride Mio, of the, let's call her Mio, Mio, uh, <laughs> the the bride of the um, the school. She's she has this offset to her so she has this kind of um feel of the pushy type character but at the same time she's um she's fighting against the system in its itself and so she she really works as a contrast to suleta um but so it, it really does i i i there's a lot of things that are intriguing in here and and i i really do like the way they're playing out the story in the background um, so you see Suleta doing her hijinks as she goes along and just bumbles through winning everything. Um, and in the background, you have this obviously dark story that's being told uh, throughout as as they're going through. Um, so, yeah, I, I do like th- that they're they're doing that and they're doing it really well, um, especially some of the uh, darker tone aspects like the um, the what they hinted at with, with clones and stuff like that yeah. and how, how disposable they are. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do like a lot of what was going on in, in there. Well, what were the, what were the um, neo new types? What were they called in the previous ones? It's pre- they're pretty much like those. <laughs> yeah. They're pretty much new types is really, <laughs> and, and, and they have pretty much psycho psycho Gundam kind of thing going on, which is kind of funny. Um, but no, I, I kind of agree. Mio Mio is obviously going to be more in the, I'm stuck in my father's shadow. And, the more serious type, don't be friends kind of thing. Whereas again, Sweat does the opposite with the bubbly nature. I will say that it, there was an obvious feel early on that a lot of people didn't like uh, Sweta because she was so, yes, overly timid, super timid. Out like this is a girl out from the sticks, Mercury <laughs> uh, type of girl, and so she was like a country bumpkin kind of coming into this very prestigious school. Obviously, being the Bennett group. And I think a lot of people were kind of put off by the fact that it felt so contrary to most mobile suits. And it's like, well, just just take it as a female version of uh, Iron Blood Orphans. Iron Blood Orphans is a bunch of dumb orphans kids and they band together. And I kind of felt that was going to be the same thing here, just with more female cast than anything. But if you think about it, there's only really three, four major female characters and the rest is male characters. So it's not... It's not too much of a stretch from the regular uh, Gundam as I would originally had thought and most people, I think, thought. Because besides the timid Sueta, the the rest of the cast is your usual fare from Gundam. It's going to be the people that are constantly just backstabbing each other. I think the only thing that people, I think, I, I think it's an honest and it's an honest criticism is they didn't like the school aspect. But I'm like, you know, it's. It's technically almost a mirror of our current society and this idea that you do have the big corporations and they have the the colleges that are an important bridging point. And yes, since the, this college, quote unquote, is technically a company's college, a lot of things are around that. The idea of what they pull together, um, compete with their mobile suits. You have a lot of these heads of each families. Their children are a part of this college. And so, yes, the... The, the quote-unquote duels that they do, not quote-unquote duels, the duels that they do in this college are very important to the global scale and the universal scale and the idea of, well, Jet Turk, who is the son of Vim Jet Turk, if he uses Vim Jet Turk's <laughs> mobile suit and it wins, everybody wants to supply money and the, yeah. the, the funding and the, the shares increase for Jet Turk. So it's an important thing. The duels aren't just duels between kids. It is a sign of their technology. It, it and it, and that's one of those things that's kind of cool to see that they've incorporated. They're they're they take things, and this is this is uh, giving a lot of credit to Sunrise in general for it, pretty much every Gundam that they've done. 
um, they're constantly very much in focus of what's what's in the the world today and incorporating it into their storytelling. So you got like crowdfunding in here. You've got um, uh, there. It seems like they have some social media, but it's not as prevalent as it was in the previous ones. Um, but yeah, there, there's constantly things that are in, in the world today that you can see tidbits of them just taking it to the next level in a Gundam setting. Yeah, it's so, a believable, believ- believable future. Right. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate the fact that with every single iteration of the Gundam franchise, they always kind of change it in some way. Like I said, technically with Iron Blood Orphans, <laughs> it was essentially space rats. They were kids that were put to work, forced labor and they're rising up against the system. Here well, again, it's more of the the children of the big companies, seemingly so far. Again, this is technically not done. We still have another season um, coming in April. It It is technically looking like it's going to be about the kids and how they don't like the system that they're kind of being forced in. It, to to, to kind of jump and compound on that, it, we were making fun of the fact that it, in the first Gundams, they, they had actual clipboards, and then later on, you start seeing mm-hmm. kind of the the monitors shrink down to, to flat screens, and then uh, at one point, we projected had... Projected screens. Yeah, now we have projected screens, so... yeah. And I think so far it's doing really well. I, I really do appreciate all the characters. And it's funny that, yes, technically, and this is to ease people's minds, Sueta, again, this isn't done yet. Sueta seemingly is the way she is for a reason. And I always like the fact that it's not just a trope character, but that their their way of acting – If you, people often forget that tropes are often based on reality. They're based on real traits of people just exaggerated. And I think with Sueta, she's kind of that opposite effect where she is – seemingly a trope but no it, there's a reason because it's based on reality and so they are doing something really interesting with her and i'm and yes they could fumble it again we're technically not quite there yet because we're still going into another core hopefully more than just another core um but they still have more they're going to develop and i think there's going to be something really cool with Sweta. her relationship with her mother again with all the theories that are going on still <laughs> it's a uh, it's intriguing, and I really want to know what the hell's going on there. But also, they, all the other characters are really fantastic because they all have their own driving force. They're all shifting their. I think this is one of those ones where you do see there's like literally five plus factions here, and everybody is out for their own gain. And to see how each one of them shift, some compromising just in order to gain power, seeing each one of those work. Shadik is probably the prime example of that whole thing. It really does feel like Shadik is somebody who's looking for opportunities and jumping to it no matter what it looks like. And again, Mioren is somebody that seems like she's in the shadow of her father, but then things shift and suddenly she realizes, oh, I kind of like this. <laughs> and so she's kind of diving into that. Um, it's a really great cast of characters. I cannot wait to see where it goes from here. But um, it's it's definitely a, a much, much, much... It's not Iron Blood Orphans. It's not uh, War in the Pocket levels quite yet, but it's it's up there. And I'm hoping that it really nails the the next core. I, I adore, and this is giving a lot of prep props to um, the voice actress for Suleta. Her, I, I think she does a fantastic job with that, that stutter. Sueta that, Forgetta? <laughs> <laughs> the stutter, yeah. The stutter. Yeah, this, the, 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 <laughs> she's a dork. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes from here. But um, yeah, that's uh, definitely a really fantastic series I'm enjoying so far. So hopefully it doesn't flop the next core. Boat to the Rock. This one was streaming on Crunchyroll and for 12 episodes done by Cloverworks. A series composition and script by Erika Yoshida, who did Tower of God and Trickster. So, did a lot better this time. <laughs> did a lot better this time. Uh, but yeah, this one uh, pretty much follows a girl named Hitori Bo- uh, Goto, who we get an idea very early that she has been pretty much an introvert her entire life, always struggling with speaking out to others, trying to... She's always afraid of saying the wrong thing to other children, this kind of led her to being pretty much a loner and then as she gets into school at some point she ends up watching this one interview with this guitarist and the guitarist admitted that they were introvert and that they fixed their introvertness (laughs) but that's a word (laughs) by introvert learning introversion by learning guitar and getting into a band and that kind of helped him get out there and so she's like okay i'm gonna do that father was apparently a guitarist so she's like hey dad can i borrow your guitar he's like yeah it's fine she gets into it starts learning Three years later, 
she learned how to play guitar, but nothing really changed. <laughs> she was talking about doing like a school festival and everything, and she never did it. She just learned how to play guitar. Uh, she did run a, a YouTube account or something like that, or whatever fake YouTube account they were talking about in that show. And where she, she became legendary status? Yeah, she she had an account called Guitar Hero. <laughs> um, but yeah, she got she got a lot of followers and everything. Uh, more subs than I do. But um, <laughs> anyhow, this cuts forward that she starts to take her guitar to school, hoping that somebody will speak up to her. She's kind of one of those introverts that if I just change something about myself, maybe somebody will come to me. Like she's always waiting for somebody to come to her, but they never do. And then eventually, yes, she has this girl named Nijika Ijika, Nijika Ichi. Ichika, Ichi, 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 I hate her last name, Nijika, Nijika confronts her in this park and says, oh my gosh, our guitarist disappeared before our show, please come help us, and just, Hattori basically being like she is, can't speak up, so she just ends up getting dragged all the way to this venue, where, um, yeah, she's, she's brought onto the stage in a box, because she hides inside of a box and plays guitar in a box, her debut was in a box, um, but yes, it's, it kind of just covers her, join this band with Nijika, Ryu, and eventually they bring in Kita, and they all have this band together. And Hitori, over time, is trying to learn to be more social, um, getting more confidence in herself, and, yes, um, learning to play with other people because she quickly finds out that she's she's really good. She's just not good at playing with other people, so she's got to learn that as well. So, Yeah, your thoughts on Bochi? This is another one that I... Of all of them, you didn't finish uh, Bochi the Rock? Did you right? not know this is literally the show that, the that Bochi, everybody's still Bochi talking about? Bochi turned into... <laughs> Bochi got legendary status like, while did, I was she got looking. Dar- she, was got, she got Darling in the Franks. <laughs> She's like zero two. <laughs> She'll never disappear. She is the 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 Marin of this season. The Darling. She is. Um, no, I, 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 I'm being dead serious. This is one that I really... Uh, hate that I never did get back to because I got to You know the what's point, great about Chris not finishing in these shows? He can't spoil anything. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I really badly wanted to get back to this and uh, where I kind of left off was around the point in which they were figuring out that who the guitar hero was. So it was it was really frustrating that I didn't get to that. Um, but yeah, I love this show. I the kind of making my joke from bef- uh, before about the um, when it comes to uh, Suleta Bochi uh, contrarily is is her her timidness is almost painful I mean I remember just almost cringing at how much she just and it, it, it was cringe in a good way of of please baby just just relax a little bit everybody everybody's gonna like that's you. literally every episode it's like <laughs> curl chill and that and that's the thing is i i absolutely love uh uh just having that that little bit of um understanding where she's coming from in the i i that's how i feel around people a lot of times where uh, where I have the benefit is I, I understand that not everybody is out to get me, um, where she still is trying to learn that, um, <laughs> the whole thing with the manager where she's afraid to tell the manager that she didn't want to work anymore because she got a lot of money <laughs> and she, she literally was just like terrified of her. And so she was, she was hoping that she could buy something that she needed or something like that. It was, it was really goofy. <laughs> But yeah, I, I I absolutely love this show. I highly suggest it, if, especially if you you have that kind of um, the the more introverted side. You'll you'll probably uh, relate to Bochi in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely a fantastic show. It looks great, at least up to the point where I I had watched where some of the scenes were just gorgeous. Watching some of the Sakuga. Yeah, I think the the great thing about the series is to get to get the visuals out of the way first, so I don't forget. It, it is a really incredibly visually pleasing show, and I think the thing that really kind of stood out most to me that I mentioned a lot of people was that it's not just an aspect of it looking good, um, visual style. It has almost like a simplicity to the character designs. It's not going for like overly detailed character designs. Um, it's just going for very flowing and very natural looking uh, characters. And the thing that really kind of stood out to me is that you have, like, Nijika, you have Ryu, you have Kita, and they all kind of just, they flow really well. Like, we, we point out, I think, in our first impressions, this one scene where uh, Nijika goes to leave Hitori at this vending machine, and as she's walking away, she kind of turns and nods at her and says goodbye, and it was like, that looked, like, perfect. <laughs> like, yeah. that looked that looked like an actual person 
you know, being very, very playful and bubbly and kind of turning to wave goodbye to somebody. Um, it looked really, really good. And yes, all the stage performances look absolutely fantastic. Um, it, it's just visually, it's a pleasing show. And then they have like a lot of artistry that's kind of being thrown into it. Not just, we're going to get into Bochi's aspect in a minute. But just the the overall perspective shots and stuff. I mean, the, the one I enjoyed the most early on was that first episode where you have there in this, you know, waiting room area or the, the practice area. And you have Nijika and Ryo are in this one side of the room. And then suddenly Goto jumps out of the box and it's all fisheye perspective. And she runs towards the camera where the two of them are standing. Um, it just looks great. Visual shots, backgrounds, characters, animation, everything. Beautiful. And then they have the detention to detail with the backdrops and everything. You have the attention to detail with the characters and their mo- uh, their movements. You see their you see more than what they can say. You see in their expressions what they're saying. Um, there's a specific, a specific shot like later on with Kita, and you know what she's kind of reminiscing about, and you can see it just in her expression. But no, <laughs> obviously, the core thing and the thing that they went crazy with was around Bochi herself, um, Hitori. She is. Obviously an introvert, <laughs> and she is a massive introvert to the point where she, it is crippling. And so with every single situation that they had in each episode, I'm, I meant to go check out the manga and see if they were equally with this, but I know that they did a lot of, um, they were given a lot of freedom with Bochi in the anime, obviously. And it really did seem like every time something happened where Bochi freezes or gets overwhelmed, they would always portray it in an artistic way. And so it stands out from the other characters because the other characters are just normally animated and they look normal. But Pochi's in the middle of them and she is just going artistically explosion. And <laughs> you have like zigzaggy lines. She looks like a blob just, zig- you know, jittering on the ground. Or they had this one segment where she starts thinking about like this sports festival and stuff. And so it's got I forget what they call them. It's the rotating. Um, it's a it's a disc and it rotates and there's a bunch of uh, characters in a circle around it. And there so when it's spin. When it spins, it makes an animation. It's a, it's a, it's called a certain type of art. It's really uh, they the they actually went out of their way to make Arisa. that. They made that thing, and just for one little brief scene, like it's physically made. They made it <laughs> just for this one brief segment in the show. Um, again, it's, it just shows that artistic creativity that they were really throwing into the show that really did blow me away. And it and it always kind of matches with her personality and what she's going through at the time. And so it's not just. It's not just art for the sake of art. It's, they're not being artsy fartsy. It it always, it always presents a story, and I really appreciate that. So, it's it's amazing. Uh, visually, absolutely amazing. Now the characters, <laughs> now the characters. Uh, Kita is best girl. That's all. No, I'm <laughs> Kita is amazing. I thought Kita's, but no, Bochi amazing. Again, I agree with Chris. I think it's an it's a. It's a levels of relatability. Yeah. Obviously, Bochi is the extreme. She is chronically like introvert. She is the point in which well, you don't really want to be at. She is the point where everything is a question mark. Every you question everything and you you have zero confidence in yourself. But yet she's amazing. And she has to be told that. She has to be shown that and she, it's it's never that she's going to accept it. And I appreciate the fact that it's never there's never a a a silver bullet. There's never a situation where it goes, okay, light switch, suddenly she's fixed. She's always, she gets a moment where it's like, yeah, girl, you did it. And then she falls. <laughs> like she is constantly falling and it's never annoying. It's, it's, it's hard to watch. It's frustrating because that's what it's intended to do. But it, it's, it's never a fix ever. And I think that's, I appreciate that. One of the, one of the nice things when, when, when I talk about the relatability, I have, um, one of the things about me is I, I tend to um, be really, really hard on myself. And so I can see that in in how Bochi relates is in, in even if she does accept, which she hardly ever accepts anything. Mm-hmm. So um, when, except money from dad. <laughs> yeah. Whenever she does accept any kind of a confidence building, she's always going out of her way to find a way to downplay herself in another way. So. Um, for instance, she, she did really good at this concert and then she turns around and says, well, I was in, I was in the box the entire time. So I did really My horribly. debut was in a box. Yeah. So, so she, she might, everybody will praise her for one thing, but she's, she's focusing on something that she did wrong. So you, no matter how you look at it, if in one case you have something that, um, 
is you're doing really good at introversion tends to exaggerate something else. So you'll you'll mm-hmm. you you have a hard time seeing the 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 fountain because you're focused on the fact that the tree is turned sideways. You 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 can't you can't you can't let go of the thing that's holding you back. If you do find something, you'll you'll end up finding something else to 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 uh, focus on, and that's that's part of those traits. And she shows a lot of those traits. She's constantly, um, yeah, while she's taking these little baby steps forward, she's always kind of taking two steps back because she's frustrated. Um, and and another uh, aspect of uh, relatability is the exhaustion after social interactions you 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 can you you're you're trying to push yourself forward but afterwards you've you've absolutely mentally destroyed yourself and and um i just you just want to curl up in a bit ball and just hide there for three days after two hours of um interaction so yeah i i find a lot of relatability i think that she is so brilliantly written i i like the fact that they one way they kind of express that was like you have these moments where she realizes that she likes something like the idea of being pulled out and going to do something with others. There's this massive amount of hesitation that she has with going out with them, but she wants to, she wants to, she wants to have friends. And so you have this whole outing and then afterwards she doesn't want it to stop. Like she's like, wait, we're going back. I don't want this to stop. Keep, let's keep doing this. And then you have like some of the Kita that says, Oh, well, yeah, next break. We'll do this every day. And then at the moment she's like, wait, no, I can't do that. <laughs> like I want it. But I don't think I can do it. Um, it's super cute. But no, besides Bochi, uh, there are other characters. Nijika is fantastic. <laughs> she is. Um, I loved her backstory with her sister and everything. I thought that was super cute. Um, she is definitely kind of like the glue that pulls everybody together. Ryu, I think, was the weakest of all of them. I do appreciate her character because she's sort of like a loner. She's a part of the group, but she's a loner. Um, and equally... And I think she's uh, brings up a good point that I really don't really don't want to forget about talking about is I really do appreciate these characters have their own lives. And it was so funny because there was one episode where we had um, there was a break and Hattori was left out. Everybody was doing things the entire break and she kept waiting for them to call her again. She's constantly waiting for other people to make the first step. And so it gets to the point where the break is almost over and they finally realize that she's been waiting this whole time. And everybody, uh, there was a few comments that I seen and I covered this thinking it was amazing. Like when this happened, this episode happened, I had to make a video because I appreciated what it was doing. There was some people that were upset because they were like, oh my gosh, they didn't bring Bochi with them to do things. They, sh- they, they're, they, 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 they let her sit there alone. How mean. And I'm going, no, that's reality. You don't get it. This writer is good with characters. Because what so many shows do is when they have a club or a band or something gets pulled together, what happens? Immediately, their entire existence is the band. That's not reality. (laughs) Nijika still has friends and places that she goes to during break. Ryu still has things that she wants to do, cafes that she wants to go to and take pictures of her food. Kita still has a lot of friends that she's hanging out with. It's not like suddenly they make this Kasako band and then suddenly they don't have lives. And so it made perfect sense that they just... They just completely forgot about Bochi. Not that they're mean. Not that they don't like her. They just figure she's doing her own thing just like they're doing their own things. And I appreciated that. <laughs> but anyway, sidetracked. Kita. Again, like I said, best girl. Loved Kita to death. She was the... She was literally one of my favorite characters, um, at least ever since, I don't know, about halfway through the show. I just think she's an absolute doll. I think she's great. She has that element of... Um, Essentially, she's the bubbly girl that everybody likes. She's the popular girl. But then you also see that, obviously, that she has her own insecurities. She has her own goals that she wants to shoot for. And then, yes, towards the later part, you see, one, how she ends up picking up somebody off the ground, and two, what she actually looks up to. And I think that was absolutely fantastic, a character for her. I, I don't want to get too in detail with Kita because she's very, she's very late story kind of stuff, but... I love her. I, I love all these characters. I think they're all fantastic. The manager's fantastic. I, we, I, blah, 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 blah. Gush, 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 blah, blah. Go watch, <laughs> go watch the show. And Chris, go finish it. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's, it's great. So highly, highly suggest Boshi the Rock. There was only one other show sort of like this Slice of Life. This is a good season of Slice of Life. Fall was a really great season of Slice of Life. So 
good to see that kind of stuff coming back. But um, the music was great, too, because they they actually they did really well in actually having the music for the show. Like typically with stuff like this, they pre record the stuff. It's an actual band that records it. This one, you felt like you can you can sense them being out of sync with each other. You can sense the flaws, I guess the best way to put it. Um, and I really appreciate they were willing to do that much effort into making the music actually fit the story. So I said I was going to stop. Go watch it. <laughs> Uncle from Another World is the next one. Watch it. Uh, up until the episode that's not released. Yeah. Oh, OK, good. <laughs> it's episode 12 then because <laughs> I think it was 13 episodes and we got 12. We're finally reviewing this. Um, I, I we even put it in our deliberations for 2022. Um, we're done waiting for the show to finish. <laughs> 12 out of 13 episodes is enough. Um, and I think based on what kind of show it is, I think it works fine. But uh, yes, Isekai Aji san. This was, I think Netflix is supposed to be streaming it. I don't even know where they're at. I think they're like on episode nine or something like that. I don't know if they'll ever actually release it. But um, yeah, this one, uh, the series composition by Kinta Ihara, who did Tsukimichi, Tough for Mobs, and Miracle Chanton. So that is the episode where she's supposedly. The last episode we had was shoot what was what was the the final point before they cut off I'm trying to remember they had the whole hot spring thing they got attacked by the monsters they they fought off the monsters and then i think from that point they were what was the final story i be? remember the hot it's spring. been like it's been like i remember month. the hot springs in and uh the entire time elf was trying debating back and forth on whether or not she was buried to him or something like that yeah, you got a crazy sniper rifle. She got a crazy sniper rifle, sniper rifle, uh, scabbard or something like that. Um, yeah, I forget. I forget where they were kind of getting to with the last episode. But anyways, um, uh, Uncle from Another World essentially opens up with uh, Oji San or this uncle of this Takafumi. Um, apparently he is w- waking up once again from be- in a car accident. Um, and he went into a coma. Takafumi's going there to pretty much serve him papers that the government's going to take care of him so he doesn't have to. <laughs> and the entire time his uncle's talking about that the entire time that he was in a coma, he was in a fantasy world and he has superpowers and magic and all this kind of stuff. And Takafumi's like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. And then suddenly the uncle finally uh, figures out that he has to use a different language in our world in order for the magic to work. And suddenly the magic works. And then Takafumi immediately cuts or shreds the paper. And he's like, all right, come home with me. Uh, and it kind of turns this whole thing where Takafumi is taking care of uncle at his house. They decide to start a YouTube channel to make money. And they're doing like different magic stuff in order to uh, get views and stuff. At some point, you have the inclusion of Fujimiya, who is childhood friend of Takafumi coming over there. And what kind of the whole thing turns into is essentially the reverse fish out of water where you have the uncle is back into our modern times. And so there's technology changes and yes, he's, it was a huge Sega fan. So he has to get caught up on the fact that Sega lost the console wars. <laughs> so he's a massive retro gaming nerd. And then you have them essentially having him use magic to project his memories of this other world. So they can sit there and basically commentary over his adventures in the other world, which was absolutely terrible because everybody in that world seen uncle as an orc they thought he was so ugly as a human he couldn't be a human he was an orc and so he was horribly treated there but of course yes he was massively op <laughs> at the same time and all the different people that he meets he saves an elf and the elf becomes like this massive tsundere that follows him everywhere um, because she basically believed that him giving her a ring to compensate was him wanting to marry her um, there's M- Mabel, who was like this shut in <laughs> that was a part of this quest line that he basically circumvented the, qu- the quest line and that completely screwed her up. And then you have the the hero of the world, uh, Alicia. So, yeah, it's it's bonkers. Your your thoughts on Uncle from Another World? I absolutely enjoyed this show. Um, I I didn't get as hot as Andrew did, but I did enjoy it. I, I really did love a lot of the girls in this show. Um, I love the 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 references to the like andrew had said the console wars and 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 a lot of the a lot of guardian heroes yeah references. guardian heroes Holy crap. i i, I did his love a, for guardian heroes was like oh my man i i i got such a kick out of the referencing like andrew was talking totally throwing off the entire um quest line for mabel um stuff like that was just absolutely brilliantly uh put into this this storyline um 
it's, it, some of the reactions to certain things were absolutely hilarious. Uh, uh, one of the quests that uh, uh, Uncle goes into uh, has to do with a a huge uh, hedgehog, and and he's going on this <laughs> random he's going on this random <laughs> tangent about hedgehogs can't be bad, no, and, the and they're he, supposed to be blue. <laughs> and he no, he's like, in, no, there's there's how they look. <laughs> He goes into talking to the thing and and, and he's like, no, kill it. it yeah, he like, translates <laughs> it. He translates what it's saying. He's like, why are you hurting people? I love to hear their screams. <laughs> Burn. So, so it, they, they're, there's just random things in there that are just absolutely brilliantly done. And and I do, I do highly suggest it. it. It is a really good show. I will say they missed one really big opportunity. There was this one moment where he goes to confront this kingdom because they were essentially trying to kill off the heroes. And he goes in there, and the the only way that he feels that he can fight back against this commander was to use the most terrifying form possible. And it was literally his teacher. And so this is big, chubby, thick chin guy, and he literally becomes the teacher because what the teacher would do whenever he would, you know, yell at somebody because this is like back further in Japanese schooling, which they would smack a kid. Um, his power was basically to just yell gibberish and then smack the person. <laughs> so this general guy's standing there and he's like, what in the world are you? And suddenly he just goes, blah, 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 and then he would slap him. And the guy was like, did you just blah, 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 smack? And then he finally goes, yes, sir. <laughs> so it was like him basically being a teacher, pushing him into submission. And But no, the missed opportunities they could have totally done. Who was like the most iconic Japanese figure in Sega history? Sagata Sanchiro. Yep. He, that would totally been perfect if they did Sagata Sanchiro, because he's literally like the the Chuck Norris of Japan jokes. Um, but no, love this show. Absolutely love this show. Putting aside um, Atelier Pontark's terrible production of it because they just kept having delays, it is a massively amazing show that I cannot express enough. And yes, it even extends to the fact that the 13th episode is delayed still. I'm absolutely surprised by that fact that this show actually looks good. <laughs> like, obviously, the original source material has a very distinct and unique character design um, to it. Very detailed hair characters. The characters are very unique. And despite the fact that it not being superly massively animated, like crazy action scenes and stuff, they nailed the character designs and they kept the character designs, for the most part, on model. And I, especially with the characters in the other world, like Elf and Mabel... They're gorgeous, and to have them actually look their character, they nailed it. Like, I, an Elf is just legit, like, waifu material of the year of 2022. I think she was absolutely gorgeous character, and they pulled off the Sundari for her so well. And like I mentioned earlier, Mabel is... She's special. <laughs> she, they, it was so funny. Mabel's one of those characters where I kept thinking I knew where they were going to take the direction of her, and they kept just changing her. Like, out of nowhere, suddenly she's this... Like, super haughty, like, oh, I gave up being a venture a long time ago. I became a part of the knights and stuff like that. Oh, you're still an adventurer. That's okay. One day you'll become a knight, too. <laughs> and then her hiding away in the middle of the forest and not wanting to get rid of this big old monument and him having to take her. It was it was hilarious. She's, she's a dork, too. But no, I love all these characters. Like, they're all great. Now, I agree with everybody. I hate Uncle... <laughs> I hate them so much, but Uncle, Uncle every, is... they're all like equally nasty. Like Elf literally calls him an orc all the time and she constantly like talks down to him. So it's like whenever Uncle does something to throw her off and she sees it as insult or just really mean, they're just terrible to each. Everybody's terrible to each it, other. So well, it kind of works. It, and, and the funny thing about or, uh, Uncle is it. I almost called him orc. Um, the funny thing about Uncle is even the first like five episodes, I remember getting on stream with Andrew while he was he was talking about it. I had just finished the episode and I'm like, I hate Uncle. He, Uncle is just the perfect. I want to hate him just because he's uncle and he he's doesn't, super oblivious he doesn't deserve he doesn't deserve these girls and, and they, i think it's brilliantly done in that respect because like andrew was saying th yeah they're they're all equally horrible to each other i mean when it comes down to it uncle he he's right in the what he's saying he's like no you don't understand elf was doing this and this and this to me and it, and obviously <laughs> and, and and when he does the replay you're like 
No, she yeah, if you look at it from that perspective, yeah, it, it, technically that is what she did. But when it comes down to it, you understand Sundetes because you understand how the 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 world it, or how anime works per se. And yeah, the original joke was technically that he went into a coma before the concept of Sundete became a, th- a thing. Yeah, which yeah, technically is true. But I, I think he was he would he was technically around when like Oscar Langley Soryu and stuff came out, but that wasn't necessarily like a thing. a thing yeah <laughs> it wasn't a popularized concept but no it it was always come down to this thing where you you kind of get where he's coming from because yes the thing that you kind of have to remind yourself every now and then is that his original introduction to this world is that he immediately got attacked by some adventure or some thug guys they dragged him to a place where they sold him for less what it was there was 30 do- or 30 it was like or something. yeah it was like pin like oh what, three three pennies was, but there was something else they sold like right after like a comb or something like that and they gave them like 30 times as much for yeah. the comb it was like he's worth like a, th- a 30th of a comb and he was thrown into a cell and treated terribly for like forever so you get why he doesn't really think anybody in this world likes him he saves this lady that has her her, her two um, siblings or daughters whatever they were and, she and then eventually the gonna... kids sneak around the corner and attack him that's how much they hate him he just saved them from an orc and they attack him um but no it's 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 great in that regard because again it, it's it's all for comedy it's all for laughs um but i love all these characters though elf's great mabel's great a uh, fujimia i freaking adore her she's she literally early on becomes like the straight face because or the straight man because Takafumi at some point gets used to his uncle and what he's doing. And then it interject uh, Fujimiya and then she becomes another party of that. But then she kind of joins in from another perspective. And then eventually you realize that she obviously loves Takafumi. And you kind of see that the relationship between them kind of blossoming. But Takafumi is just as dumb as uncle sometimes. <laughs> so he doesn't get it either. Um and then eventually they they add in Sawai, who is Fujimiya's friend. She becomes the straight man for a little bit. But it always kind of changes the formula every time they do that. So it's not overdone. But overall, like the yeah, that it's not too heavy with the gaming references. But there is quite a few of them that when they bring it up, it's like, holy crap, that's hilarious. Um, I, do, I don't think it relies on it too much. It's kind of a surface level for the most part for the major comedy beats. Uh, most of the jokes is it's isekai jokes. They are making fun of a person in another world that's OP and the crazy world that they're in that's terrible, full of terrible people. <laughs> Let's be honest. And it just nails it every time. The etchy is fantastic. Mostly elf. It's mostly kind of sit around elf. They'll get Mabel and Alicia in there later on. But yeah, it's it's really spicy, really good etchy that I that I really enjoyed. It's not it's not too much of it. It's like it's maybe once every episode or so it's not like every single scene is something etchy it's just every now and then they'll give you a little bit of fan service and then they kind of move on so the poor heroes team sucks <laughs> had to go to the dungeon twice because he had to raise their mind so they can achieve it themselves and then he does it he goes to do it again uh, there's a lot of funny co- uh, jokes around the idea that he knows how to erase people's minds so whenever something bad happens he just erases them and they're not really sure if it's it's kind of like the men in black thing where they're not sure if it messes people's up a little bit um it's great though this is literally my favorite comedy in a long time like this was this show literally every episode had me gut laughing and that is saying something when a show at least for me um has me gut laughing because i think the last time i really had heavy gut laughs was probably konosuba season one um it's saying something i i chuckle at shows i smile at shows i snicker at shows but gut laughs this one had it and it did it in spades so i highly suggest people check out the series it's absolutely fantastic it's a it's a huge recommendation yes i I don't know when we're gonna have the last episode i'm assuming probably at the end of winter but it it was enough for me like i had i had plenty of laughs to say that this is a an anime of the year kind of contender so yeah yeah that's uh uncle from another world check that out Chainsaw Man. This one was streaming on Crunchyroll for 12 episodes, done by Studio Mappa, of course. Uh, script writer by Hiroshi Seko, who did Ajin, Jujutsu Jujutsu Kaisen, uh, Banana Fish, Attack on Titan, Summertime Render. Uh, did you finish this one? Doubt it. Did Got you even start it? No. it? I did actually do an episode. You did an episode. Maybe two. I don't Maybe remember. <laughs> I, I, do you I, see Power Smash something? <laughs> I think so. Okay, you watched two episodes. You got it. You got it. You can review it now. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> But no, this one essentially follows a guy named Dingy. He's uh, pretty much 
some like an outcast of society. Everybody kind of looks down at him. I didn't see the bathroom money. scene. You didn't see the bathroom. Scene, I so did you, not. You did not get a third episode then. Um, but no, Dingy is kind of th- a throw out of society. He essentially is in massive debt because his father left him a debt from the mafia. And so the mafia has basically been forcing him to work and yes, do devil killing on the side for extra money. And this is all an effort to pay off his debts that his father owes. But yeah, this world itself is pretty much our setting, modern times, but there's the existence of devils. There's devils, fiends, and demi-humans, essentially. Um, devils are essentially, can be anything. So if there's an object in this world or a concept, it can become a devil. And so you have, like, in the first episode, you have a tomato devil. Yes, there's a tomato devil. The odd thing is, though, is that the the power of the devil itself is based on the fear of society of that object. So if something is more feared, like a tomato, apparently tomatoes aren't that feared because they're not that strong. A tomato devil wasn't that strong. Um, The more they're feared, the more powerful they become. This becomes like a story beat with around the third or fourth episode where they talk about this gun devil. And it was this idea that mankind, um, in fear of devils, started giving out weaponry to fight against the devils. And then crime started breaking out with those weapons. And eventually the fear in society became so great that a gun devil massacred (laughs) like a huge population, like millions of people in a split second. So they quickly had to get the weapons back (laughs) and they had to cover up what happened on on the news so that people stopped fearing it. Um, But yeah, basically the concept of it being feared makes it more powerful. But uh, anyways, at some point, and, and the fiends are basically ones that transfer from being a devil into semi-human so they retain they take a human form but they'll usually have some sort of oddity about their head like with power is one of the characters in the show she has horns and she's a blood devil a uh, blood fiend and then the the demi humans i don't know if they really specified a name for it is essentially people that are half which is what dingy eventually becomes so anyways, um, Dingy eventually gets double-crossed by the Mafia guy. Um, they kill him, and then he had this pet devil, which was Pochita. It was a devil chainsaw dog. And Pochita, <laughs> trying to help Dingy live on, decides to give Dingy his heart, and that allows Dingy to live on, but it also makes him part chainsaw devil. So he's able to pull the string on his, on, on his chest, and it busts out these huge chainsaw blades out of his hands and his head, and he's able to destroy things. And then he ends up, quickly gets picked up by the public safety group, which is this government organization in Japan that essentially handles devil situations. And he's put into the secret group that has uh, fiends and and whatnot and people that use devils to fight against the devils. So he's with Aki, who Aki is packed with um, cer- certain devils. I don't want to get too, too many details on who's packed with what because that technically is revealed over time. Um, Power, who, like I said before, is the blood devil that's turned into a fiend and... Kobane, she's there, and then Arai. <laughs> Um, and yeah, they go out and they kill devils. And the, the core story here is that Makima, who leads their group, is essentially using Denji. She's she's giving Denji food, which he's never had before. She's basically manipulating him by kind of dragging him on with her manipulation, and um, promise that if she if he finds and kills the the gun devil, she will give him a reward a reward. So. Yeah, that's, that's basically the concept of it. Um, what was your thought of the first two episodes? It just it wasn't working for you or just you didn't have time for it? It didn't work for me in either way. I, I wasn't expecting it to really work for me. Um, some of the characters, uh, the personalities were very interesting, but it, it, that's about as far as it got for me. I do acknowledge that it looks great. Um, I, I do acknowledge that the storyline obviously really picks up at some point. Um it just in the first two episodes, I don't think it, I I got a good chance to start seeing it open up um, uh, as, because it, it did set up a lot of the standard shonen uh, s- setup. Like you've got factions starting to be built. You have the obviously a mafia group that's that's behind the scenes. You have a, a secret government organization that's behind the scenes. You obviously have the devils and then you have your rank ranking uh system going uh immediately build building into like andrew was talking about the um based on how much fear you've got different l- levels of power that are that are being set up so it it easily is going to become a very fantastic shonen uh setup right there and so yeah i i from what i could tell it, everything is is ready to be a fantastic show yeah i think the 
to get the visual stuff out of the way, yeah, I, I really do think visually it looks really fantastic. The directing work was just absolutely phenomenal. A lot of this perspective shots, the visual perspective, uh, the visual shots, the backdrops, everything looked really incredible. I think the only thing that I could say, and it's probably one everybody's going to know, is the only issue that I really had was some of the CGI dingy shots just didn't work. Yes, I understand that a lot of the shots may there was like a lot of issues with people saying you may think it was CGI, but it wasn't actually. There was some obvious CGI spots. And it looked very obvious. Well, it was mostly it, the faraway shots of Dingy when she he was just swinging around his arms. It just looked super awkward. But it, every of the shot was fantastic. It's one of those things that it, it's like okay, let, let let me let me because I I I would automatically say the same thing. I mean the CG thing. It's it's like okay if you take the CG out. And put it over here, and you put it against other CGI shows. It looked pretty daggum good as far as CG is concerned. All of the animated shot or regularly animated shots, um, they looked fantastic. So you've got, but because immediately CGI is involved in this automatically, that drops. No, the CGI itself was good compared to most CGI shows. Yeah, and so it's like. Yeah, you can give a little bit of leeway on that. It, I mean, it doesn't automatically make the tin tin looking show immediately of two because the CGI, which was good CGI, yeah, it looks awkward against the show in general. But it's like, how how do you how do you even? It, it's good CGI. Yeah, it looks bad compared to the rest of the animated show, but. It's still good CGI. I, I, it, it's, it's one of those things that you can, you can dislike something. In a show. Yeah, you can dislike something <laughs> can, in the it's show. Okay. It's okay. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't have to be a perfect show. <laughs> Nothing's gonna be a perfect show. But it still doesn't mean that it looked completely. I, I've seen bad CGI. Yeah, th- Trust that, that me. That was the other thing. Like I was, <laughs> I was pointing out like it, it was, it was good. Like it, it still worked. And every, everybody's like, no, you talk about it. it's terrible. And I was like. No, Go lo- no watch. What was it? The, the no Bahamut I- one. You have no idea. Oh, poor child. You have no idea. What was it? Was it Infinite uh, Bahamut or something like that? Something like that. Where yeah. they they didn't even get the the skin on the Dagum CGI. It was still no it was still a frame. <laughs> no texture. But no, it, it's outside of that. The visual, like I said, looked absolutely fantastic. A lot of the action scenes were great. They expand a lot of the action scenes. This is one of those ones where I was reading the manga right alongside that. I was watching the episodes and. They were adding so much more to the battles. Like the battles were much more extended, which I think is fantastic. They were adding a lot of scenes. They only cut one scene, and that was like the very first scene where Makima is taking him away from this, taking her back to the to the public safety. And at some point, he kind of gets stray. He was going to run away, and he ends up running this girl that had a devil with him. And they cut that, which was kind of unfortunate, but it didn't ruin the show. Um, for the most part, I, I think they did a really, this is one of those ones where I really do feel like this kind of transcends the manga. Like this is one of those ones where I kind of want to wait for the second season before reading on because I just feel like it's doing everything great and they're adding so much to it. The music, the sound effects, the character voicing, everything besides Kobane screaming for an entire episode. <laughs> That's the only thing that I didn't really like about an adaptation. Everybody that was like, no, Kobane's great. And then the episode happens they're like, holy crap, I don't remember her being that obnoxious in the manga. I'm like, because you can't hear her. <laughs> You just see text. Um, it's much more wor- It's much more worse when you actually can hear. And she did a great job. Don't get me wrong. She did a great job voicing it. Hats off to her. But it was super annoying. Um, but no, for the, fir- the for the most part, like I think it transcends the manga through and through. And I think they did a phenomenal job of it. But I, I, this is kind of one of those shows where early on I was like, okay, it just looks really good. I'm liking it. I'm not liking Denji so much. And I really do respect what they're doing with Denji. He is the reject of society slowly gaining purpose. But I think the the big selling point was when you finally get the group together. Aki, Power, Denji. You get the band together. And then suddenly the chemistry starts kicking. Well, mainly mainly the chemistry is Denji and Power. Those two together are dorks. They're just absolute dorks together. Because Power is constantly trying to get somebody to kill Denji because she just finds it funny. So, like, this whole thing with Kobane, she's literally telling Kobane that Denji ate all the food. And so Kobane goes to kill Denji. <laughs> and she's laughing the whole time. Um, they're great. They're absolutely great together. I think their their chemistry is fantastic. Um I do appreciate the story beats, the development. I like the concept of the devils, the devils and the power of the devils and the fear. All that stuff's great. Um, the the first moment that things start hitting the fan where they first run into the katana was like, holy crap, this episode. 
And then something happened that I think, in the end, when I look back at this series, there's only one thing that really stands out. And this is the one of those kind of troubling things where I wonder if this is a good thing or a bad thing. When I look back at the show, and this, this is something I was bringing up, I think, in our deliberations. When I look back at the show, nothing really stands out as memorable. Except for Makima. Makima, in the end, ends up being the only thing that was like, holy crap, yeah, this thing was cool. Everything else is like, yeah, that was a cool fight. Yeah, that was a cool fight. Makima was the only thing that was truly, like, super fascinating and super intriguing. And I'm still intrigued by Makima. She is the ultimate manipulator. But she also has this air, this air of, like, power. Like, not power as in power, the character. Just this, like, what is she? <laughs> like, you want to know what the hell is she? Um, she literally is the most intriguing thing about the show. And I want to know more constantly about her. And it's kind of sad when I think about the fact that, yes, besides the whole first hit with Katana and that whole aftermath of everything just basically exploding in front of your face when you're trying to wonder what the hell's happening. Makuma, in the end, I think was the bit most intriguing, besides power and Denji's chemistry. I think that was super fun. Makuma was really the most fascinating thing about the show, and I cannot... I, I really, that's kind of the reason why I want more of this series, is to really kind of dig into more about what's going on in the background and the gun devil and everything like that, but... For now, it's kind of like it had. I do have to admit that the ending was a little bit like, okay, that kind of just wrapped up really simply. <laughs> like the last battle just felt like so anticlimactic. Now reading a little bit ahead past the anime, I understand why they stopped where they stopped, but it really, I, I almost want to feel like this core just almost feels a little bit unsatisfying in the end, just because it just drops off so quickly. But overall, like the series is really fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Um, again, most of it's because of Makima, but. It's just, it's just a, it's the misfits. It's the misfits basically saving society. And yes, there's a little bit of a society doesn't appreciate what they do or it's too covered up that nobody knows because essentially the, the government covers up everything because they don't want people to know that something happened because then they'll fear it and then they'll make it powerful. Um, but I am, I'm definitely looking forward to more of it. So I'll see, I'll see how far I get in the manga. I've, I've read quite a bit, but um, that's mainly because I really want one big answer. <laughs> But yeah, that's uh, that's Chainsaw Man. Check that out if that's interesting to you. That's that's uh, that's that. Spy X Family. Yes, that show completed. I forgot about that. Uh, Spy X Family Part Two ended last season. Of course, it's what Studio and Cloverworks working on it. Um, for those that don't know, it's essentially about this guy that is Twilight. That is a spy that works behind the scenes in order to stop the war between Westalis and Nostania. At some point, he gets assigned this Operation Strix, where he has to procure a wife and a daughter, and then send that daughter to this university because there's a guy in there, Donovan Desmond, that is not seen in public, so he's hard to get a hold of to really kind of question him about his, apparently him working behind the scenes to create the war between Westalis and Arsania again. So he's got to get Anya prepped and sent in there and get these Stellas so that she can get into the meeting, so he can get in the meeting to meet with Donovan. And yes, the Gork is that Anya can secretly read minds, uh, Yor, who is his wife that he procures, is secretly an assassin. And then, of course, he is a spy. So you have each one of them trying to hide their own identities while Anya knows everybody's identity because she can read minds, but she's too young to really do anything or to make sense of 90% of it. Did you finish the part two? I think so. You think so? It was he, it was kind of an anticlimactic ending. Yes. <laughs> it's like... There was oh, a finally, meeting. We, yeah, that, that was it. Yeah, they, they finally got a meeting and... That was it. But, um, yeah, I, your thoughts on it? I are, are you one of the many people who is just kind of cooling down on Spike? No, family? I was never really hot on this show. Mm. That's what sucks. I, I've enjoyed the show, so please don't Chris misunderstand. Chris is a contrarian now. Uh, no, I've... I, well, if you think <laughs> I, back... It was never good. Push glasses. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think back on, on, on our first impressions, I mean, you were super hype on it. And I really, really enjoyed Mr. Henderson. I thought that was absolutely <laughs> Everybody hilarious. loved Henry Henderson. Um, it but, souls. It, but I was never and really, Becky. I was never really super hype on it. And, and I, I enjoyed the show just fine. Um, and, and I, I, but it, so I just kept going through it and just enjoying myself watching the show. And even this season, it, it, I, I, I just found myself going, yeah, the adding adding in uh Fiona honestly was and Bondo. 
uh, Bond, Don't forget Bond, Bond, did, Bond didn't do much for me at all, honestly. <laughs> didn't really, I, got, like, wanted, one I wanted Bond to work so bad. Oof. I really did. Um, but Fiona, however, she was hilarious. That absolutely I got a lot of kick out of, um, especially the... The tennis match, I thought it was absolutely hilarious. And I yes, I know that you I, did not like it. I love that part I, I thought she, it was hilarious, the fact that it, Andrew Andrew's uh, review on, on that, it, it was like... I love when she said skeet in her head over and over again. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you remember that one time where she went in her head and said skeet? Um, she, she like likes him, dice ski. And, um, and, and then she... That so one anyway, line, if, you go on a, that? if you're done derailing me, I actually I thought it was funny. Um, and I... I I, I I got such a kick out of a lot of the uh, the interplay between um, the uh, the tennis match and 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 how they were trying to uh, undermine uh, Lloyd and and uh, Fiona and that was just hilarious. I I thought every time they they would figure something out, it would just get a little bit more and more extreme uh, across the board. I thought it was funny. Uh, so yeah, but overall. Still didn't save the show for me. I I still think it's a good and enjoyable show. There's a lot of goofy things going on. Anya is absolutely adorable. I I will uh, no matter how how much I I, I absolutely love Becky. Becky is about freaking, to say. Uh, I'm waiting for you to actually say something about Becky. <laughs> but yeah, uh, like overall, Fiona so I'm really much, enjoying like the Becky. show. No, I I I my whole thing was like the first core or first part, which was I think back in winter or something like that. Was super good. I, I think the introduction of the character was fantastic. The chemistry is great. There, it the whole concept was the hiding of your secret while living together in this one household, and I think it was really great at that. And you're hiding how super powerful she is, but yes, yeah, she can't cook because you, you got to have one bad side about yourself. We need a real your episode. We need a real your episode. Anya being super cute and dorky and talking about peanuts and and going to school and getting the fight with Desmond and trying to figure out how to meet, be friends with Desmond while the entire time Becky thinks that Anya is madly in love with Damien and Becky this season falls in love with Lloyd. Um, all that stuff's great. I absolutely loved their chemistry, but then they never really did anything with it beyond that, with that core concept that I think was pure gold. Your does nothing but worry if she can't cook. She literally never kills again. Like he literally, she'd never be, she's never assassin anymore. Like she, that whole, that was her whole stick stick at the very beginning was that Anya was thinking about the fact that she, you literally, your goes out and kills people. And yet it never, they never show it ever again. She just, again, is just sitting at home worrying about if Lloyd is going to leave her because she can't cook very well. Lloyd's still doing his stuff, which I think is great. And and Anya is still doing her thing, but your becomes literally non-existent besides worrying about food. And th that's kind of what was starting to progress towards the later part of the first part. Then they had like this most anticlimactic end of the first part. Things kick back up with the first the second part, I think, really well with the whole college kids going out trying to take out this one guy and respark the war. Sylvia coming in and literally chewing the hell out of these kids saying, you do not know what you're talking about have you ever like sylvia literally lays it out like have you ever you know smelt the burning flesh of your family members nearby you starving on a street trying to think about how you're gonna get food having family come back from the war that are so scarred that they can't think straight like she literally lays into these kids and then yes the introduction of bond which i think was a cute introduction anya working with bond to try to save lloyd was great and that's it like that was that was part two like the rest of it was just kind of Okay, that's um, that was a good episode, I guess. Like I said, Becky's whole backstory thing was a really quick, cute little backstory, and I think it ended really well with the with the first meeting. I think the whole thing with Damien was super good, but it just feels like it was a little bit too little, too late because overall, part two is it's it's good, like it's fine. Like I'm not saying that Spike's family is bad. It's just it slowly over time, kind of just turned into. This the characters really just doing really nothing much of anything and having these brief moments of something cool happening. It never it never got to the standards of what Spike's family was from the very beginning. So it's not me disagreeing really really technically with Chris. I, I think in our first impression for part two is because I was probably high on the fact that they just had the introduction of Bond and they had the whole fight with the the college kids. 
because after that, it kind of just turns into shrug. This this show just is there, and I think, and I think, like I said before, it's it's mostly what I think. What I'm come to conclusion about, I think it's because of your. I think your there's three pillars in the show. It's Lloyd, Anya, and your, and your isn't doing anything. So it's it's tilted. It's always going to be tilted until they finally do something with your besides have her complain about cooking. <laughs> the, the, and and this is this is something that I I think that from an author author's perspective I can kind of understand. I think Yor is in this weird spot of to make her um, do her job. She has to kill. People. She has to kill people, and that <laughs> would you don't that would that. lose all of her innocence, or all of her moe factor. If for if uh, uh, to to put in a different perspective, her moe factor is half 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 of it is her her innocence. Now, yeah, you can have the the. The gap moe with her uh, assassinations side, but you have to introduce that very carefully because you you can easily sully her and and turn her into something that you really don't want to have. Which is funny because her introduction, what was it? She was in her, a bathroom cleaning blood off with yeah. a corpse behind her. Like that was her introduction. So why are we afraid of going back to that? Unless again, the writer's gotten too far away from it, and he's afraid of going back to it. Yeah. Now people keep saying, "Just wait, just wait." I'm waiting. I'm still waiting. <laughs> like, yeah. We're we're, we're 20, two we're two seasons twenty five <laughs> episodes in. I'm still waiting for well, this moment. And, and that goes to what I was saying when I kind of interrupted Andrew a minute ago. We need a your episode. Yeah. We desperately need a your episode. That is one thing that pretty much everybody would agree on. We need. Your, we've got lots of Lloyd, we've got lots of Anya, we've got introduced to new characters, and we've gotten into them. Well, we, had, we still we had more have Fiona. Not, we had more Fiona this season. We than had we we had a massive Yuri episode. We had a massive Fiona episode. We've we've even kind of scratched the surface on on uh, hand, handler. I mean, and Daybreak. Don't forget uh, yeah. Daybreak. We, so we're we're getting all these other characters, but one of the core, like Andrew said, one of the core three pillars. She is sadly not. Yeah, we're getting a little bit. We got a little bit with uh, Yuri. We got a little bit with Fiona. But when it comes down to it, we need a your centric episode. And I think it's. I think it wasn't as bad in the first part because you still had your doing things like super violent in the midst of saving Anya. Mm-hmm. Like the whole scene with the guys trying to kidnap Anya is like your comes in and just completely wrecks them. So you still had that kind of thing to just to kind of keep you appeased to it. But again, besides like one brief scene, like the second episode where she she took out those one guys that were trying to get the dog, it wasn't really much there. And that's again that's that's, that's the unfortunate thing, but. I don't know. We'll see. I, I think they were trying to kind of subtly get us back into the mood of your being an assassin because they had the whole segment where they were talking about <laughs> possibly your taking Anya out to because Anya had to do a report on one of her parents on, on a job that she wanted to uh, learn later on in her life. And so there was this brief moment where she was looking into what your did in her life and your starts going off about, oh, what would it be like if I took Anya with me on one of my assassins? And it felt like they were trying to kind of slip in there the idea of you know she goes out of her way to get around all the guards because the guards aren't at fault to get to straight to her target like the whole idea was that don't kill innocents just your target and i almost felt like they were doing that just to kind of show that your is very um particular about this is my target and i got to make sure that my target is a target that i need to take out and where they're at and avoid everybody else so i almost felt like they were going to try to ease us into it but no Anyways, that's enough talking about how <laughs> the show fails. It still looks good. Great music. Great characters. Just it needs to do something. And that, that's the unfortunate thing. And I think um, th- we've got some developments of characters like Damien, Becky, um, obviously had a really great moment. And I'm looking forward to more still. But And it looks like it's not going to take very long. They, I think they said the second season is going to be kicking off this year um, or a movie. movie and, they have a movie and a, another season coming. So, And the movie's supposed to be original. So interesting stuff. Maybe the movie will be original because it's going to actually have your kill somebody. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Let's do Muvla of Alternative second season. Uh, this I one, didn't catch up on this either. You didn't watch Muvla? <laughs> uh, this was on Crunchyroll for 12 episode. Uh, this one was based off a of visual novel, obviously. And um, by the way, just got to just gotta talk myself up here. I had my episode 23 impressions of Muvla of Alternative had a comment on YouTube by the creator of Muv Love. Really? So I was really, 
I was on cloud here, nine. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. <laughs> I was, I was on cloud. There nine. you go. There, you got him. Got a pat on his back thank, for y'all. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, virtual head, uh, back padding. <laughs> but no, um, yeah. So I don't know what how detail I want to get into this because again, we're technically what at this point twenty four episodes into it. But essentially, it opens up with Shiragane is this guy that he had a normal life in Japan, and at some point he gets transported into an alternative, al- alternate world where it's the same people in the world except for like literally most all the men are dead um it's an alternate world where essentially in the past aliens invaded earth and started killing everybody and so most of all mankind has been pretty much wiped out at this point uh the main crux story is that shirgane early on he was resetting so he would do things and he would end up dying and then he reset to this one point and through that he gained knowledge of this alternative four which is at the point in which Alternative 4 is what he wants to make success because Alternative 5, which is this global project, is where mankind leaves. Like, they ditch, and they leave the world to rot, basically. And so he wants to make sure that this Alternative 4 is a success so that doesn't happen. And so he goes into this facility, and he meets up with Kozuki, who is the leader of this Alternative 4 project, and basically tells her, look, this needs to happen because I know the future. And she kind of questions him for a little bit, but then kind of realizes that he's kind of telling the truth. And so the two of them kind of work side by side to make alternative four success. And we don't learn until like way later, like in part two or second, second season, what that alternative four is. So I don't want to get into details on it, but um, it's basically Mecca's him working alongside a group of other girls who, yes, were all his classmates in his previous world who all pilot Mecca's and fight against the beta. And yeah, like I said, make this alternative project work. You get a little bit of a jumping back and forth between our world and this other world where he's trying to get information to make that project a success, his relationship with certain characters, and then ultimately um, pain because it's Muv Love. At least the Muv Loves that I've watched, which is just Swartz and Marken in this one. <laughs> Somebody correct me at some point. I'm like, yep, this totally got Muv Love. And they're like, well, technically... Uh, most Muv Love's not like this. I'm like, yeah, but see, I've only <laughs> I've only watched two shows that's Muv Love, and it's well, I've I've also watched Rumble Hearts and stuff, but um, I've only watched two technically between Muv Love and and Swords of Mark, and so that's all I know is pain. And yes, season two gets very pain. Um, it, well, Swords of Mark and uh, like totally <laughs> um, made me distrust anything. It's having probably to the do worst with of Muv all Love. of it. It's probably the worst of all of it. They, they, poor Freckles. That's all I have to say. Oh, Freckles. Spoiler, Freckles. But no, I, I, I really do love this franchise, this, this series. I will say that it's not a perfect series by any stretch. There was even some points in this second season where the quality really tanked. Uh, there was like two episodes where just animation wasn't working. <laughs> and the only thing I can really excuse it by is the fact that right after those two episodes, we had this big big massive fight and i will say that massive fight was hype like that that first episode especially when the this big fight starts i was like holy crap they are doing some incredible the music was ramping up at the perfect times you had these great shots of mechas coming down from this lower shot and just all these missiles going off and and these mechas just darting off first person perspective shots of mechas going after beta and just sword play and guns going off everywhere it was absolutely fantastic it was a great battle sequence so it kind of excused the two episodes of rough standard animation they were doing they they, they do a really great job of the series with the me- the mechas because obviously the mechas are cgi the beta are cgi some of the beta still to this day kind of ugh, they look weird um but for the most i think that's the point they're supposed to look weird but it's just it's a weird cgi but the mechas they look so great like whatever they're doing with like the 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 texturing and the cell shadedness to it looks super great. Like it's some of the best CGI mechas in anime that I've seen, but um, yeah, give you the story. <laughs> I think this season had like three really pinnacle points that really stood out to me. And I will admit that there's a few points in between those segments where it wasn't as great, but those key points really did sell me on the second part versus the first part. The first part really felt like introductions it felt like let's build into this kind of inner conflict within Japan itself because obviously other nations like U.S. want to just drop a gravity bomb and just be done with it. But obviously Japan doesn't want to lose their lands to a gravity bomb. <laughs> and the U.N.'s kind of helping them. You have a lot of the conflicts within the U.N. itself. And ultimately getting into the fact that all these characters are kind of important somehow to certain groups and why they're there. And it kind of builds up into this whole aspect about 
Japan's pride, like the pride in Japan in itself and the desire for people to protect it, reclaim it for themselves and protect it themselves. And I think that the way they pulled that stuff off and how they kind of integrated the soldiers from the U.S. and the U.N. all into that conflict was absolutely fantastic. Like that, the ending parts of that first core, first part, season one, was absolutely fantastic. Part two, I think, kind of more cements the ultimate goal, which, like I said earlier, is Alternative 4. And they finally kind of present that concept with Shiragane essentially realizing at some point that he is breaking things and he wants to escape from it. So you have this moment of tragedy. You have this moment where he's trying to run away from everything. And then at some point he realizes he can't run away from it because him running away from the whole situation is only getting more people killed. I'm not going to get into details how that is <laughs> because that's spoilers, but it was interesting that that was the way they presented a way to force him to take responsibility for the situation. Um, and that kind of progressed into really seeing the core of Alternative 4 and how important it is to him. And I thought that was really an incredible scene with a certain character. And then it all kind of builds up into one big epic battle at the end of this 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 core, which I thought was, again, like I said earlier, absolutely fantastic. And it really kind of it was a it was a turning point for humanity because this entire for the this last like, I don't know, 20 so episodes, 21 episodes has been mankind is in the crapper. Everything sucks everybody's dying, we never win, and then finally that was the point which we see, not that they win, that they have a, a, a beam of light, a, a, a beacon of light that finally changes everything, and I think that was a, it was, it was kind of impactful just to watch it, and it didn't end too well, but it at least opens doors for the future story, which comes to my biggest kind of issue that I'm having right now, we don't know if we're going to get another season, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not done. Um, so this this that that does become the big struggles. I I don't it's it's one of those ones where I almost struggle saying to watch it unless we ever get another season announcement. We knew that part two was coming, even in part one. Uh, or again, seasons part, whatever. Um, we knew that another part was coming with fall. We just don't know if another part's coming after this. And that's the big struggle is because it's an unfinished story and We've we finally got a victory, essentially, and I really want to see where it goes from here. And I don't know if it's ever going to have a continuation. But I will stay still say that I have really, really enjoyed my time watching Level of Alternative. Um, I also really want to say love the community. Had a lot of fun doing my impressions videos on Level of Alternative were, were fantastic. But I love the community. Like the the community was fantastic. I even said to the to the creator when he commented on my video, I'm like. You know, thanks for making an incredible story because your fans are fantastic and they love your property, obviously, because they want to support people that are, you know, covering it. And I would love to see more. So I, I even told him in the comment reply, I said, please give us more. <laughs> I don't know if he's he's good at using the translator. Hopefully, hopefully it translates to Japanese good enough and he understands it. I, I'm assuming he knows English because he watched my video unless he just found a video and was like, oh, somebody made a video on my stuff. Thanks for your feedback. Like, that's all he said is like, thanks for your feedback. I'm like. I have to check, recheck the video, make sure I didn't criticize him. <laughs> I didn't, I meant to go back and check to see if I criticized him somehow. And he's like, oh man, thanks for the feedback. Um, but yeah, the fandom's great and the, um, the show is great. Andrew got an auto translated. Yeah, auto translated. You use the auto translator. So it's like, you know, bucket of fish is, is flying over the McDonald's and stuff. I don't know. Sometimes that translating doesn't work well, especially with names. Anyways, I, I love the series. I, I really, I need a second, I need another season. Third season, part three, whatever you want to call it. Um, because I'm I'm kind of invested and I, I want to see where these characters go from here. And there's still a lot of unanswered questions, especially like this whole aspect of Shiragane affecting the other world. I have my theories on what Shiragane is. that still needs to be answered. <laughs> Sumika stuff needs to be answered. Um, yeah, I, I want more. So that's my level of alternative. Check that out if that's interesting to you. And you like pain. Arc Knight's Prelude to Dawn, a series that ran for eight episodes done by Studio Star Pictures and was, uh, yeah. Y did you watch this one? Nope. Oh, man. I think this was the one. I that didn't I, even start did, was this Was this the one that I said? I don't know if this is one of the ones I said, dude, you got to watch this one. Um, but I don't yeah, think so. This is obviously based off a of mobile game, which is Arc Knight's. And yeah, th that's was like my biggest concern coming into the show. But I am. I, I'm happy to say. It's amazing. <laughs> I really love it. Like my big, this was my literally my biggest shock 
of the entire 2020, 2020, 2020, 2022 uh, year. Did you go back in time? 2020, 2020? Something like 2020, that. I don't know. 2020, 2020, 2020. Okay, yeah. Anyways, joke. Dead. <laughs> Anyways, this one opens up in a... How do I describe this? Essentially, you have the the perspective of the doctor early on, where this doctor wakes up in this bed. He was in cryo sleep. He's being woken up by this girl named Amia. Amia is the leader of this group called Rose Island. And they're trying to extract Doctor to get out of this facility. And he's completely forgotten about his past. Apparently, he was this leader in the research of this cure for this disease that's inflicting the world. Because, yes, in this world, they discover this resource known as Arignium. And this Arignium is a really powerful resource. It's being used to run a lot of things. It also run, It also powers arts, which are like magic. And what came with the Arignium is an infection called that they end up calling Oropathy. And this Oropathy infection, infection eventually kind of spreads throughout the body, and it crystallizes the body till eventually they die. And then it will shatter, and it will spread throughout the air, and it can infect other people. And the government, in response to this disease, decided to create a massive amount of fear of it. Anybody that was infected gets pretty much isolated, and they have to be... They, they basically get rejected from society. They don't even get treatment. They don't get you know, they don't get help or anything like that. It even came to the point where a lot of clinics that were, a lot of the clinics were secretly treating people with arpathy because they were afraid of people knowing about them being infected. And so all this fear around the people infected eventually led to, yes, people not too happy about being treated as an outsider because they're infected, which is the creation of reunion. And reunion, again, is a group of people that all seek to essentially take over the government and fight back against the disinclusion of them from society because they have this disease. And so you have the governments treating the people infected terribly. You have the people that are being treated treated terribly becoming reunion to fight back. In the middle, you have Rhodes Island, which again is run by this um, Amia. And the Rhodes Island is really about trying to essentially be peaceful, like come together, like the people that are infected, treat them, take care of them, Give them treatments they need so they can survive. Try to find a cure. And then at the same time, they're having to work with the government. Government, please stop treating them terribly and they won't fight back against you. Let's work together. Let us see your your people. Open your borders. Let the people in. Take care of them. That's really the Rhodes Island's whole thing. Um, And Amia being like the... Early on, you really do get a sense that Amia is all about saving everybody. She doesn't like, you know, harming people. Even when they fight against the reunion, you'll see the reunion get taken out. They'll treat them immediately and try to save their lives and, you know, give them treatments they need. And again, if they're infected, trying to get them treatment for that. Um, she's very much so about, let's not kill each other kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this kind of leads to this big occurrence in this area they are, are actually at where essentially there's this thing known as, what was it called? Uh, I didn't write down the name of it. It's like this catastrophe. And what happens is that every now and then this catastrophe will happen where the arignium essentially rains from the sky. <laughs> it's like a f- like raining fire. And essentially this area gets completely wiped by it and they eventually flee and they go to another nearby um, Lungman, another nearby uh, city where they end up trying to infiltrate in there, work with that government itself to, again, try to treat the infected and also warn them that the reunion is coming to fight them. And that turns into a big crazy happening at Lungman. So, yeah. All right. So like I said earlier, I absolutely loved this show. I was extremely surprised by it. This is going to go down as one of those types of um, series where it's based on a mobile game, but it's not the sum of being a mobile game. It's kind of like a fate grand order kind of situation where despite the fact that it's a story placed inside of a gotcha game, it's like the writers know what they're doing. (laughs) Like it's like they hired good writers. It's not that they just hired writers to make cute characters so that people roll for them. This is, like, first and foremost, a story. And then, they, they yes, there's gotcha characters in it, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, but no, the writing's super good. Um, it's impactful. It's world-building is fantastic. Getting into the Arignium, the different societies, the, these mobile... They're essentially all these cities are mobile. Because, yeah, technically when a catastrophe's coming, the, the city wants to move. And so they actually... All these cities are actually mobile and they move around. And getting into all that kind of stuff is fantastic. How the, each of these governments are run the fear created around the reunion, the mindset of the reunion. You essentially have bad guys that you understand. You don't agree with them, but you understand why the reunion are so angry. It's because they're being treated terribly. They're second class. They're rejected. 
Um, so you understand why they're issue, why they have issues with the government. And at its core is just really get great characters that are kind of conflicted with that kind of stuff. And it gets me more excited to know that as I was covering this show on a weekly basis, which again, is kind of similar to Mob Love, love the, the fans, love the, the Ark Knights fans. Um, besides the fact that most of them were just saying, play the game. Uh, they were all fantastic. The Mob Loves were doing that too. Uh, Mob Loves were doing that one too. But no, it's, it's, it's really good to know that the fans were essentially telling me, informing me that this is like the tutorial segment. And it's not that good. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, if this tutorial is this good, I can't wait for future stuff because they're talking about like it gets crazier later on. So just just wait, which is great that we already know that more is coming. Um, they already announced more seasons. So it's got me super excited because, like I said, I'm already into these characters. I'm into the world. I in. I'm invested in what this 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 creation they've done so far. And I, I think it was great because my initial impressions, again, that was a mobile game. The, the initial draw for me was obvious that you have cute animal girls poofy jackets and guns does you give me those three things i'm all for it i <laughs> i was joking uh with several people that the only thing you could add to this to make it like the only way you can make this better is if it had edgy but it, i'll i'll survive without the edgy um because i just love everything else about the show the designs and this is one of those shows where it's not that you star pictures did a great job like it almost felt like they had passion for this project because it just felt like everything Everything oozed that they love this property, and they were going to give it a really good adaptation. And despite the fact that every now and then you almost felt like they didn't have the budget or the time to really get some great animation in there, they replaced it with style. They replaced it with directing. Because the odd thing is this entire show is is um, widescreen perspective. But all the perspective shots were fantastic. You didn't have characters standing there and lips flapping and a camera on their faces when they're talking. It was Perspective shots constantly shifting, so you get a sense of the area around them. You you always had like a sense for what was going on nearby. When they were talking about healing, you know, taking care of the injured, you'd have this low perspective shots of all these reunions kind of laying inside this building while somebody's healing them. Visual storytelling really is what it is. It tells by showing you. While yeah, maybe there's some dialogues happening at the same time. So overall, hugely invested. The last episode just. They nailed it. Like, the last episode nailed it. Like, I wasn't sure how they were going to kind of book in the series, but the last episode really, really nailed it. They they took Ami in a, in a direction that I think is going to be really fantastic, and I cannot wait to see where it goes from here. So, highly suggest Arknights Prelude to Dawn. Um, do, not, do not look at it as just a mobile game. Um, look at it as a story that definitely has some creativity behind it. So, I really got to go back and see how, how far I was in this uh the game yeah i don't think i'll ever, I, just, I want to get into the game for the story but i just don't have time um because the the thing is, is like yeah i could probably get more context from the game but it's like if i had the time like my time is deviated to certain things and yes technically anime is going to be more condensed story but i mean that's just like getting into the story of genshin it's like i'm never going to be able to do that. i don't have the time for yeah. genshin story that's way that's worse i'd rather read the entire of love visual novel than read genshin story because it's going to be just as long <laughs> if i want to invest that time and i'm, I invest and, it in I'm something else. And, and the sad thing is i'm behind in genshin i i'm i'm stuck in this the that there's a time loop thing in in one of the cities in sumer oh goodness like, that was terrible and I, I can't do anything because every time I go into, I almost Sumer's... quit the game. Then <laughs> I almost quit the game. Then yeah, it's a uh, Ark Knight Prelude to Dawn. Check that out if that's interesting to you. Baby Fowl Princess uh, or Mushi <gasps> something Kaburi. I can get involved in. Mushi Kaburi Hime. Um, only re- the reason that that kind of stands out in my head is because you always call yourself Mushi, Mushi Kaburi. Anyways, um, yeah, this one is done by Madhouse. Done by or sources of light novel genres are romance. Yeah, romance. Wow. A romance anime. <laughs> that don't happen often. Um, director was Taro uh, Iwasaki, who did Sweetness and Lightning and One Rink One Friends. Uh, series composition by Mitsutaka Hirota, who did Spirit Chronicles, Rent-A-Girlfriend, and Eden Zero. And I got threes. Uh, and this one essentially follows a girl named uh, Eliana Bernstein. And she is pretty much a massive bookworm. Because that's pretty much her family. Like, her entire family is... They're just bookworms, and that's all they do. They put they they said they put it they put reading books above everything else, including eating. It's just a thing in their it's a thing in their life. I would say in their bloodline, but it's just them. 
<laughs> can't really say it's in their genes. Uh, but at some point, she is ends up getting confronted by the prince of this kingdom, which is his name is Christopher. And not this Christopher. That's the only reason you like uh, the show is because yeah, she exactly. kept saying Christopher. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> it. But no, this prince. That's, that's my version of ASMR. Th- this this <laughs> prince essentially tells her, look, um, I want you to become my fiance. And you're the best. She's like, why me? I'm like, I-, I barely even get involved with anybody. There's plenty of other options for you. He's like, that's exactly why I want you. I, I want somebody that's outside of the politics. Like there's constantly people at each other's throats. And she is, and her family is literally outside of that. They don't have, their their family hasn't really picked a side in the political wars. So he specifically wants her for that reason. And he says, look, you don't have to, I don't expect anything of you. Just, you can stay at my side. You can read your books. I'll even give you access to the Royal Library. And she's immediately like, what? All right, cool, I'll do it. <laughs> like she only does it because she gets access to like the the vault basically so he brings her to that vault and she just goes crazy just reading all these books and stuff and yeah that kind of starts this whole thing is the idea that christopher is doing his his work as prince and the entire time eliana is coming in with her books and she sits there and reads her books all the time and you get these little interactions every now and then between the two of them is you know something will come up in the kingdom and he'll question with her and she'll kind of give her two cents about it based on her knowledge and all eventually leads to I don't know if I really want to get into this. I think uh, from if if you can read the first or watch the first two episodes before you listen to this review any further, if you really are serious about the show, because I think it was absolutely phenomenal. I don't want to get more into details because I think that was a really cool twist to it. Um, but yeah, that aside, spoilers, uh, soft spoilers going forward uh, beyond the, the second episode. It kind of just turns this whole thing where you have this conflict happening where Eliana herself believes that she is useless. She believes that she is just, again, a mushikaburi, a a bibliophile princess. She's useless. She's a fake fiancé. She's only there for a temporary time. Christopher will get bored. He'll move on. He'll find another girl. I'm just going to enjoy my books. That's all I really like to do. And she kind of sees herself as useless. So you do have kind of this conflict in the mind of Eliana that she feels like she's not efficient or she's not useful to anybody and that she's only in the way. But at the same time, you slowly over time realize, wait, no, everybody takes your, your, you are a book of knowledge. Like she is literally a book of knowledge. And if anybody has any sort of problem, there's knowledge in her through history's texts and the knowledge of the past and all the the writings of other kingdoms. She can offer up information that literally can save lives or change, uh, open the, open the eyes of certain people to issues that they may be running into in the future and it's that realization at some point that i think and ultimately in the end makes her an incredibly fantastic character at the same time you have all the characters around him like christopher and him his dealing with politics and yes technically trying to keep eliana in a safe place because again there is conflicts within the kingdom itself and yes other kingdoms Um, some people that don't like the advice that eliana has technically given the kingdom which some may view as good advice, while others might see as things that may weaken their 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 stronghold in the the overall Game of Thrones, as you want to say it, <laughs> the the power struggles. Um, all that stuff is kind of all mixed inside there. Well, yes, the question marks around Eliana and her relationship with Christopher, and if Christopher really does love Eliana, because that's a constant question mark. <laughs> <laughs> I I think to to jump right into the reviews, I think that's about, that, that that was the only one that I was like a little bit like girl. At this point, girl, really? At this point, you're still wondering that? <laughs> I understand why, though. Like, the later part was like, well, the queen said it. So why wouldn't she trust the queen? But, um, yeah, your thoughts? First off, I, I absolutely love the show. I, 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 you didn't I think do it, it right. You didn't do it right. <laughs> Come on, give us a gut one. I, I, I... <laughs> Come on, Chris. I love this show. <laughs> it's been a while. Come on. Um, I know the biggest um, if I was to give this show any criticism, um, it would be that I think that the biggest weakness is this show's biggest strength. Um, the biggest strength of this show is that it it does very well at painting uh, uh, Ileana as this kind of almost oblivious character where she she is constantly going through 
um, this, and, and I, we, we, I think we talked about the idea of this is a Brick's character done right. Um, I, I, I think that she's, it, she's brilliantly written in the fact of this character who's just so oblivious to things going on around her. She's constantly helping people and, um, showing people that, Hey, that you can do this. Um, this is, this is recorded in history. She's this wealth of knowledge, like Andrew had mentioned. Um, but here's my tidbit. It's also its biggest weakness. You technically have a bookworm. Yeah, she's always walking around with a book in her hand. But the story is such that it tries really hard to um, paint the um, the activities around her that they forget that, in a way, she's a bookworm. And so, yeah, she, every once in a while, she, or she's always carrying a book, but she's not... Every once in a while, they'll put her on on the couch to next to the prince to to read some some a little bit of her book, but she doesn't have time to actually be a bookworm. She's constantly reacting to things around her, even though she is oblivious to things around her. I I know that sounds funny, but it, when you if you if you haven't watched it, you would understand what I'm saying. Is she's const- There's there's so many events going on around her, she doesn't have time to actually be a bookworm. So. In a way, that that's what I mean by it. It's the biggest strength and the biggest weakness of the show is the fact that she is a wealth of knowledge and she's constantly uh, affecting things around her. But she's a bookworm, and so technically, I feel like I want to see her in a book more. Um, well, it's always kind of this thing where she's always sitting there reading, and then somebody would kind of charge in and say, "Yeah, oh my gosh, this thing's happening," and Christopher would go what do you think Eliana about this whole situation with this place? And she go, well, if, if it's like this whole situation with this period of time, they did this in order to fix that situation. They go, Oh yeah, that's right. That was a part. What was the details of that? And she would get into the details of it. And again, she's like literally a book that opens up in front of them and says, yeah. look at the history. And they go, okay, let's do this. And then suddenly again, she shifts the entire tides of things. And that can, conf- that conflicts with other people sometimes. Well, and 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 to the credit, you, I mean, you don't want to sit here and watch like fifteen minutes of her reading a book. I mean, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that. It, you would usually see Christopher talking to somebody, and then in the background, you'd be sitting there flipping through the pages. <laughs> She's just sitting there doing that, and then it would get too loud, and then he go shh, and then she would kind of flip another page, or they, they would literally have Christopher talking to Eliana, and then eventually at some point she looks up and goes, "Oh, Christopher, what's going on?" <laughs> like there was times where she literally wasn't even hearing him. It, it, it's 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 one of those things. I I understand why it's not that way. It, it, it's just one of those things. I it, it I I think that it is its biggest strength, and I also think it's kind of a weakness of the show. But at the same time, I think she's slowly trying to do things more. I mean, yeah. they literally take her out and do things. Oh, well, whereas literally up until the point that Christopher pre- presents her to be his fiance, that's all she did for her entire life up yeah. until that point. That's all she did for up until her teens. All she did was read books. And, and and that and, and that's that's one of the things. At some point, she does acknowledge that Christopher became more important to her than books, which was a big realization for her. And and that that's that's like I said, to its credit, there is a reason for this stuff. Is she's actually shifting her priorities to Chris, Christopher? She is changing what she values in in trying to make herself a quote unquote princess or queen uh uh queen to be i mean she is actually in line for the throne so she wants to do that and that's where her priorities are shifting i think Um, that was the the most fast i think the most fascinating thing about this show is really um eliana and not really just that but more the the public perception of eliana because i did get a couple times where i did run into people on discord and stuff that weren't a fan of eliana and honestly i understood what they were saying like, I can't argue against it. It's but it's it comes down to one of those things of not necessarily seeing her the same way I do. The way that I viewed that the series portrayed Eliana is that, yes, I don't know. Necess- Bricks. I know why Chris is using the Bricks character um, de- uh, classification for our podcast is because she sometimes feels like that character that's always on the side that almost doesn't seem like she thinks for herself that constantly gets pulled around by Christopher or something. But I really more see it as an idea that she is literally a bookworm. And that's 
all she does is read. And so she's has to be pulled around because she, otherwise she's going to be constantly looking at the book. She, somebody's got to go, girl, you got to move over here. Otherwise you, you're getting rained on. You're standing in the middle of the, you're standing in the middle of this area right here. And the, there's no cover over you. You need to move out of the rain. Um, though she wouldn't do that because the pages would get wet. And the yeah, she, furious. she would freak out. <laughs> She would start screaming she, and 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 call for the death of the she'll, the, the. She'll take the down a prince if she has to if if they mess up a book. Um, she almost did. <laughs> this is a girl that literally all she does is read, and there's two aspects to it. One being the idea that she's learning how to communicate to other people and to see that her communication affects people and lives of kingdoms itself. Like there is power in her voice. And this most of this show is really seeing that she's realizing at some point there is power to what I say. And I need to make sure I choose my words very, very wisely. And she even discredits what she says. She thinks it's a mistake that she speaks up. But then others show her, look, I trust your words. That's why I accept your words and apply them to what I'm doing. So there's that whole side of it. But there's the other side of it that's showing you that she is in her own mind isolated. Like, she doesn't even know who Christopher is when he first comes to her. And they've been around each other for a long time, apparently. That's what she doesn't realize, is things going on around her. And I and I know that's frustrating to some people. But for me, I think that's really good writing to not just completely, first, first two episodes, suddenly, boom, she is a blossom flower. And she's suddenly running around and cheerful and saying, forget books, I am now a princess. No, she's always a bookworm and she's always stuck in that and she's super socially awkward and the willingness for the writer to take their time to slowly pull her out of that shell and to show her through different experiences that you can look up every now and then again technically to the point of christopher can you accept christopher more than your books or books are books always going to be your priority will people around you ever be a priority it's a slow progress, and I think even to the point of the end of the, se- the series, it's still not to the point where even some people that I've seen comment on the internet will ever be happy with her. I'm happy with her. I'm absolutely happy. Because I think thrilled. she's a very beautiful character that's very beautifully wrote. She's not a character that's a social butterfly. She is a bookworm that has immense knowledge. She's super smart, and the effects that she has on people around her is immeasurable. And... I think the show did a great job of portraying that. That was my whole point with the first two episodes. And I think the first two episodes is literally my argument to most people. Watch the first episode. It's pretty boring. Not boring, but it's just not nothing happening. Like you're going, what is, what is this show? All she's doing is reading her book and this Christopher guy wants to marry her. What are we doing? The second episode was the sign of how it's going to play out is where you have that moment where you are... You, mainly the first two episodes is you, from the perspective of Eliana, feeling like she's not a part of anything. Everybody's moving ahead. Christopher's got a new girlfriend. He's moving on. That's fine. Nobody needs me anyways. I just need my books. At the end of the episode, we get a realization from the perspective of everybody else how important Eliana is. Everybody step forward. What did she do for you? Oh, she told us about this new cooking method that could save our, our crops or whatever. Oh, yeah, she told us about this weather pattern. Oh, yeah, they, she told us about this. Oh, yeah, that vase, she showed that, that, that it was fake. She never seen any of that. We didn't see any of that because we were seeing the perspective of her where she's just kind of in her books going, oh, yeah, this is, this is wrong. It, that was like the perfect example of what I feel like the entire series is, is her being out of the loop and slowly kind of being pulled into the loop. So... Anyways, absolutely love this Beautiful. show. One of the best shows. <laughs> Eliana never cut her hair. Spoilers. That's a big shot. Yes, they, they, that makes it a, a 15 out of 10. Just, I was like, just let the very know. beginning. I'm like, this girl's hair is massive and got some body and they're going to cut it eventually. Nope. Bad house. Never cut it. That's good. Um, anyways. Highly suggest it. Um, Just wait I for Christopher pretty, to leave her, then then she'll I cut think her it's hair. A, <laughs> and I think it's a really solid romance, too, because I felt like I understood the romance. It's not, it's very lovey-dovey, but it's not your usual romance. It's not trying to get, like, all these story beats of romance. It's just kind of a, he seen value in her and appreciated what she was. She was oblivious to him, but then over time realizing how much she needed him. And I think that that was a... A different but a very solid romance there as well. So I think just for like romance alone, it's like, holy crap, that we'd barely ever get a show that's just romance. And that was it. I will admit there's one story arc that I didn't like, which I think was like this was the second story arc where they went to the, um, the camp. They had that, 
Yeah, they had the camp, and the noble was trying to frame them to get them to fight against them. It was just, it was kind it of was, it, I would, I would agree that was probably the weakest out of the yeah. group. I, I, I didn't it, hate it. It was yeah, like but I was, was so was hot on the, the I was so hot on those first two episodes, and we got into that part. I'm like, wait, I just got done doing it. First impressions, how great this show is, and this is not really doing much for me. But everything after that, I really, I really enjoyed. So, I suggest it. I suggest it. I'm the villainous, so I'm taming the final boss. This is a series that streamed on Crunchyroll for 12 episodes done by Maho Films based on a light novel. The director was Kumiko Habara, who did Million Lives. I'm standing on a Million Lives. And series composition by Kenta Ihara, who did Tomodachi Game, Trapped in a Dating Sim, All Routes Lead to Doom, Tsukimichi Moonlit Fantasy, Miroko-chan. And yeah, this one opens up with Eileen, who has just been told by the prince of this kingdom that she, he's getting rid of her. He's breaking off his marriage with her because he's found Lilia, this wonderful Lilia, this, you know, the, the, the typical Tome game trope. <laughs> the middle of a ball, I'm breaking up my engagement because you're so mean. And yes, that's the point which Eileen suddenly remembers all these dreams she's been having. She's had these dreams where she was this very sick girl with this terminal illness that had no cure. And the entire time she's sitting in this hospital bed, she's playing this Tome game. And then she realizes... Oh, I'm in the Atoma game, and I am the villainous. <laughs> it all makes sense now. And that, oh yeah, by the way, the villainous always dies in every single route. She ends up, this, essentially what happens in the Atoma game is at some point, this demon lord goes crazy after being betrayed by the prince, goes crazy, turns into a dragon, and then will smash the villainous Eileen under his foot. So she realized at that point, I gotta figure out how to stop me from dying. Um, apparently the prince is already mad at me. I'm the villainous, so I got an idea. I'm going to go <laughs> tell the the demon lord that I want to wed him, and maybe that'll put me in a position that I won't get squished. So yeah, she marches off. She, bas she first kind of bows to the prince and says, I've always loved you, walks out the door. That completely throws him off. And she goes immediately to the demon lord's castle and confronts him and says, hey, let's get married. And he immediately freaks out and his emotions control the weather. So like this lightning strike comes down and she just passes out and she wakes up in front of him. He's on his throne and he's like, now what were you saying? And she's like, let's get married. Uh, let's, let's be together. And he's like, wait, do you love me? And she's like, no, I don't. <laughs> it's just mutually beneficial. <laughs> and he immediately teleports her back to her home in her bed. So what kind of follows this is that she's constantly trying to go to the demon Lord proposing that they get together. Um, all the while, the prince is cutting her off from all the resources she had. She had this whole kind of shop set up with her family and everything, and he's pretty much t took all the uh, resources from her. So she's got to build new shops and new things that she wants to develop, all the while trying to help the demon lord and his people, kind of coexisting with the demons themselves. And you find out over time that there's like this pact, this um, non-aggression pact between the demons and the humans, that yes, Claude is actually the brother of Cedric, and he was kind of... Once they found out that he had demon blood, they kind of had him stay away. That's why there's a this this pack that's kind of set up. And so she's constantly trying to make sure that there's a coexistence existence happening between the two of them because she knows that Claude really does like the fact that pact exists. And all the while, Cedric's trying to mess up things because he's jealous of his brother. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and that's, um, that's basically the gist of it. And there's like three story arcs that all feel kind of interesting in layout. So your thoughts? I actually very much enjoyed the show. You should have um, finished the show because like this one ended like, I don't know, early December. <laughs> no, I really, I, I, this was one of the ones that I, I really, like I said, I really enjoyed the show. So I really did push through this one. Um, it's, it, it is this kind of weird, um, w like Andrew is saying it, there's, there's a lot of interesting tidbits in here that, um, I really wanted to see played out. Um, but at the same, the same time, I do acknowledge the fact that while there's, there's bits of brilliance in there, um, I don't think it was well, um, portrayed. And that's the, probably the biggest frustration I have with this, where, um, I, I love the fact of, um, Eileen immediately turning around and saying, okay, well, I have to do this, um, and so therefore I'm going to try and get get with Claude. Um, that 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 aspect is is well done, especially in the first uh, first part. I think it the first arc was absolutely fantastic. The second one, 
it, it, it's kind of played out as this is the um, extended version of the story. But Eileen technically is not in the second one because she should have died in the first uh, uh, story. So how do they how do they put um, Eileen, who is supposed to be not there, into the second one? And I think they did OK in kind of incorporating her into the second arc. Um, but it did feel a little bit like they were trying really hard to get that one to pull together. And in the end, they did OK, um, especially uh, at the end of that arc. They kind of introduced the quote unquote twist, which I thought was OK. It, it did get my interest a lot because I wanted to see what they would do with that. Um, and then the third arc, they they played that off. This, this was a kind of a fan uh, um, story that was kind of a spinoff and. That one, I'm not sure. Um, I I ultimately liked what they did uh, when they when they finally resolved everything. Um, but ultimately, that one did feel the most out of place. Um, and maybe that's a credit to it being a fan spinoff. And so it's it's not canon. It's not it's canon. Not canon so, so it's not real. And that's that's the interesting aspect is. I see the brilliance of different aspects where I, but yeah, because I mean, that's the argument that we always had with these Atome game types of things. It's about the fact that most, I think pretty much every single time, except for one, it's always, you're the villain, the, the main character is a villainous. And so they're avoiding flags and that's the, that's the setup. But it's like, well, once you avoid the flags, what now? And I think this one did a good job of doing that because again, it was introducing, let's just say expansions and those expansions were expanding the story further and further, and she was having to figure out how to get around it. But like you said, the biggest problem really lays is that it does. It almost feels like it's rushing too quickly through each one of them. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It, it it it's it's like they're trying to do something interesting with this, and and the the author has these ideas that he wants to do, but he can't find his footing on how he wants to do it. Or the. And, the anime is blitzing through stuff too fast that that's possible too it, it just when it comes down to it and this is what i why why i say i love the story i think it's really cool i i like a lot of the characters i i i think that they're um at least mostly relatable um there's a lot of fun characters in there there's a almond. lot of almond is fantastic almond's great um, the dancing bird <laughs> It, but when it comes down to it, 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 it just never felt like it quite found where it wanted to be in this. It, it, it's 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 a consequence of really cool ideas that never quite make it to its full fruition. So I enjoyed myself watching the show. I, and that's the frustration is I almost feel like I, I, I understand why they seemingly blitzed through as much as they did in order to get the three arcs out, because the last arc is the punchline. I mean, it feels like it feels like the last arc f really does feel like everything comes to conclusion. Um, but I almost feel like this is one of those ones where I almost say just watch the first arc and just stop watching because it feels like a complete story. It feels very fast and the conclusion of it's pretty fast, but it at least feels it, the first arc was perfect. Like I loved it. It was fantastic. It had me super hyped for stuff going forward. And it almost feels like once the first arc's over, suddenly it's like, it feels like there's a time jump because suddenly the characters are acting very familiar with each other. And it's like, wait, OK, wow, this has progressed really quickly over just a span of a week between episodes. But um, it, it never really lived up to that first arc's story. Like the second arc, I just felt like was a throwaway. It just was like shrug. And then the final arc, I, I really didn't like the antagonist. I just was like, oh, we're doing this, whatever. Uh-huh. OK, sure. Like she that character lost their flavor so fast. I actually liked the mystique of the character early on more than anything. So that was my struggles. Like I appreciate that they got to the story arc they wanted to get to, but at the same time, at what cost it was what feels like a waste of a uh, waste of potential for everything else because they seemingly, it felt like they rushed through so much stuff. But again, I will, I'll still, I'll still stand by that first arc was really good. And I think Eileen 
really carried the show for me, even though I wasn't really enjoying the second arc and onward. I just really like Eileen character. Yeah. I mean, the, the stupid bird costume stuff was like that was my joy for that entire second arc was this stupid little holding up signs bird costume going squawk. <laughs> And Claude going, you're interesting to me. Why are you so interesting to me? Why won't you tell me who you are? Um, that stuff was fantastic. But um, I, I mean, there was a lot of stuff around Claude that I did really like with the last arc um, because it really does feel like it's one of those things where it's a trope and the idea of the almost the reset. But at the same time, it was it was nice to see that that kind of came through like Eileen's. Eileen's perseverance came through because what you kind of get a sense from early on is that, yes, Eileen has gone to Claude, the demon Lord, because she's selfish. She doesn't want to die. I mean, <laughs> who's going to blame her? Can't really call it selfish when you're like, literally, I got to get a, I got to figure out how to get around this. And what kind of happens is because Eileen is such a good person and a likable person, you do see her seeing what's important to people around her and trying to accommodate for those. And over time herself, enjoying it like the whole situation with the the, the uh, ketabus or whatever that got loose the pup that got loose early on she went out of her way to retrieve it because she knew it was going to cause this this pact this this non-aggression pact to be ruined and she did not want to lose that so she took upon herself blame just to protect what claude found so important and it was that that was an establishing point right there of like dang eileen's a really likable character like she's a good person and claude sees that and it was a funny aspect in the idea that Claude just wants to break her. <laughs> Claude just wants to, I want to see you cry. You never cry. I want to see you cry. Is that weird? Yes, it's weird, Claude. But some people are into it. Um, it has good characters that are kind of mixed through here. I even like Cedric early on. Like the prince and how mad he got and stupidly jealous was like, was really interesting to me. And like I said, the whole thing with the, the protagonist girl, which was like early on was like, is she... Is she manipulating things? Is she just trying to go for her natural goal as the protagonist of the story? Is she just playing out what she normally does? She's supposed to go to Claude and and trigger something in Claude. She's supposed to do that in the story. So it all makes sense. But again, I think besides the whole reset aspect of the, the final arc, it just felt like those last two arcs just didn't really work out. Did it make it a terrible show? No. I just, it never lived up to the hype of that first arc. Everything beyond that just didn't, didn't deliver in that same way and I, I still suggest people check out that first arc like just watch that alone it, it, watch beyond that and if it doesn't work out for you you know you can just stop but I, I think that first arc alone is really good it's a really interesting take on the whole Atome game aspect which honestly when you're looking at another Isekai Atome game was it doing differently and I think it pulls that stuff off so that's my that's my end game I, I, I don't think it looked that incredible either it was it was a very it almost felt at times very bare minimum, but they they kept it together for the most part. <laughs> they kept it together for the most part. Yeah, it's uh I'm the villainous, so I'm taming the final boss. And yeah, Ria Takahashi is a main girl, Eileen. But she nailed it. Always like Ria Takahashi. Did you finish the farm related skills? Do I, I want to admit to it? That's the question. You have to, otherwise I I, I skip it because I didn't finish it. Yeah, I finished it. You didn't finish Boach the Rock, but you, I was waiting for one of those ones. You didn't finish Boach the Rock, but you finished, I've like, gotten stronger. I have somehow gotten stronger when I improved my farm-related skills. Uh, this one's streamed on High Dive, run for 12 episodes. Um, uh, Toko Machida did the, the series composition, and she's great. Um, did it save this show? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, this one essentially opens up with Al Wayne, who, like... He's a farmer and he just farms and he realizes really quickly that he's got like all these extra stats and, and multipliers and stuff. And so he's like incredibly powerful for some reason. Um, and then he saves the princess from some kidnappers and she offers him like a bunch of farming land in the royal palace. But he doesn't want it because he wants his own farm and do his own thing. And then like the demon lord like attacks the kingdom and he uses his um, his farming hoe to like kill everything. And um, and then the the guild mistress lady, she like. Um, is like tormented by some terrible thing that happened to her village a long time ago. And then, and then she can transform into parts of a dragon for some reason and do party tricks like Aqua from Konosuba. And then um, that's as far as I got. Is it amazing? No. Um, you finished it. You should be amazing. <laughs> what, I, what kept you watching? I guess is the question mark. Continue. Because I knew that you weren't going to be able to cover it. Oh, he um, took a bullet. He took a bullet. I could cover it. I just watch it four times speed and finish it. 
<laughs> Thank you, high dive for four times speed. <laughs> no, I didn't want to do that. Um, I this this show is fine. the 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 issue is there. You go, beast tamers are now. <laughs> Sorry, go. As far as a harem, it does fine. It, and I think that that's probably its best strength is the harem aspect. Um, but the the problem is is that it doesn't get into a lot of the goofy shenanigans that most harems do. So it doesn't feel like a harem in a lot of cases. It does have the harem elements. I mean, all of these girls that he bumps into at some point decide that they're going to marry him and they argue with each other. That's pretty much harem 101. Now, as far as the the tool that keeps him going uh as Farming far as tool? a I, exactly <laughs> um as far as a harem protagonist it, that is his farming he doesn't he doesn't do anything outside of farming and so therefore he him wooing all these girls and having them fall in love with him is fine and since he doesn't really ha- think of anything outside of um farming that's his reason for not no- noticing that all these girls are in love with him. As for the main story, he's reluctantly a uh, a hero because he is super overpowered and all the all the adventurers and adventure guild and uh, the kingdom want him to keep being this hero, even though he's not really a hero. He's a farmer. He chucks that, a carrot to kill a dragon. Exactly. That a really is, terribly CGI dragon at that note. That is probably my biggest beef with the show is that it doesn't quite work. I like how the, the As demon re- lord was like walking upon the kingdom and he's like, wait, they're going around my farm. I guess I'm good. And he just lets them go. <laughs> like he just lets the demon lord army walk past, even though, you know, it's not that point he goes he's going, into a, he goes into a but five- then he's like, oh, wait. But then if they destroy the kingdom, I won't have anybody to sell my vegetables to. This is bad. I gotta do something. <laughs> well, this is this is the thing. Okay, reluctant it's charm. Hero. I like it, it. It is, it is I guess in a way it's charming. I he, he's he's really the, I mean, he is the definition of a reluctant hero. I mean yeah, he literally he, hero he, it point. felt like one one episode he went into this five minute rant over the stupid um weed that attacks his farm and so he goes into town to get a weed killer and somehow that ends up him going into this other uh he he bumps into a character blah 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 um has to go and save another kingdom because of this character and because the antagonist which that is a massive spoiler that the the antagonist of this this particular section it's totally the mailman no the mailman's um, the last you're, boss. You're, you're going to love that, the, <laughs> the, the actual antagonist even more when I tell you offline. Um, when he bumps into the antagonist, um, the the weed comes back into play as this thing that the antagonist acknowledges the stupid weed that he ranted about for what felt like five minutes ago or for five minutes and blah, blah, blah. It the 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 fact that this is a him being the reluctant hero is probably the most annoying aspect of this show. Well, I mean, I think the troubling thing with that mentality is the fact that at least from the the second arc, it felt like they were trying to get really dark. Like the guild lady story was super dark. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, what the concept for the second arc is that there's a dragon that will go around to villages. He will kill everybody but one person and then he purposely lets that one person live so they can feed off of the dread of that person so that he can become strong again and do it again it's a terrible cycle of tragedy and then in the middle of it is al wayne (laughs) and he can't he can't he he can't break al wayne because then all all he thinks about is farming and then end it with a party trick with the (laughs) arms turning into dragons well and i mean i don't i don't to, to be clear i don't have a problem with a reluctant hero um reluctant heroes can be a good thing the problem with al wayne as a reluctant hero is his motivations for doing a lot of his stuff are very very contrived well i just can't see a a character being in suffering i mean you didn't 
put enough emphasis on why that re- that reason is. It, I mean, going on a quest to save uh, the guild mistress for uh, I can't read her name or Helen Helen. Um, just going to save her because she's um, you you can't protect her or you can't see her in pain is not sufficient enough unless you go into the backstory which they do get to eventually and and uh that that involves his his little sister um that is not it at the beginning it doesn't set up enough of his backstory to explain why he is the reluctant hero He's just a reluctant hero because, well, I I can't, like Andrew said, I can't, I can't, I don't like the idea that the demons might be coming into my farm. Okay, I guess, but it's just not the the that that's my problem is the the reasons he does he's motivated are too contrived. They're not they're not setting it up enough to give him a solid motivation. There you go. That's it's goofy. I'm somehow gotten stronger. Yeah, the the carrot chucking was funny. That's it. Beast Tamer. Let's talk about some fun stuff. <laughs> Beast Tamer. This one streamed on Crunchyroll for 13 episodes, uh, done by EMT Squared. The d- director was Atsushi uh, N- Nigorikawa, who did Love Tyrant, Between the Sky and the Sea, and I did training series composition by Takashi Aoshima, who did Onipan. Kakushigoto and Uzaki chan. Come on, come on, come on, true. Come on, 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 bear. But this one opens up with Ryan Shroud, who has just been kicked out of the heroes party. Big shock. Unique idea right now. <laughs> they said that he's completely useless. He's a beast tamer, the worst class in the entire world for any class for adventurers. Um, because all they could do is really just tame animals and scout. He was very useful for them, particularly because he was moving their stuff. He would tame animals to be like pack animals. He would have his bird scout ahead. He was really good at showing them where to go, but they didn't see him as useful, so they kicked him out. And so being kicked out, he's like, well, crap, um, what do I do now? And some kids in in the village itself confront him and say, oh, you're from the Heroes Party, right? He's like, yeah, not really anymore. (laughs) Um, He gets a quick idea that, one, the village, the town itself really respected Ryan. They always, like take care of him. He went to the shops. The shop owners owned, liked him, but they hated everybody else. Like everybody in this town hated the rest of the heroes party. And so that becomes very obvious to him, but you know, he's still got to move on with his life. So he decides, well, I'll just become adventure. So he signs up for the adventure guild. They're kind of reluctant with him because like, again, they're like, Oh, you're just a beast tamer. You know, shouldn't you party up with somebody? He's like, no, I'll be fine. Um, Cause he's very, he's very skilled outside of just being a beast tamer. He's just kind of very clever. What you kind of find out over time is that yes, He's not just a normal beast tamer. <laughs> Obviously, he's a main character. He's got to be powerful somehow. Um, he quickly ends up running into a girl named Kanade, who ends up being one of these, what do they call it? Something spirits. Ultimate spirits. Ultimate spirits, something like that. Uh, she's one of these ultimate spirits, which are these different special spirits that are incredibly powerful and very rare to find. Um, you find out really quickly that Kanade used to live up in the mountains with the other spirits up there, but at some point she decided to leave. That's why she's actually amongst the humans again. Um, he say, he tries to save her from a tiger, <laughs> fails miserably, and as he's nearly going to get killed, the Kanade wakes up with one last burst of energy and takes out the tiger. Come to find out she's just hungry, obviously. Um, but they talk over time, and Ryan tells her about the fact they got kicked out of the party, and she really quickly realized that he's kind of special somehow. Like, you, you get over... She kind of mentions it later on, but the idea that he wasn't interested in you know, gaining something from her. Like she's special again, like everybody else she runs into, they want to you, they want to abuse her and, and, and exploit her for their own gain. They want to sell her. They want to use her for her power. Ryan's different. He never really kind of wanted anything from Kanade. And so she found that special, but she also noticed that there was something special about him and the idea that she believes that there, he's unique in the idea that he could possibly tame her. So she says it, try to tame me. She's like, okay, well, I don't think it'll work, but sure. We'll try it. Sure enough. Ryan is a beast timer that can actually tame these ultimate spirits and it works. But not only that, but he actually gains like some stats from her, unique abilities from her. And so it makes him super OP strong physically too. So, um, yeah, it kind of continues from here on and they travel together. They end up running into Tanya, who's a, this ultimate spirit dragon thing and tames her, um, and so on and so forth. And all the while in the background, you see the hero's party is 
super bitter and still hates them. But then they realize really quickly that we got this other beast tamer and they suck. <laughs> And they're like, why can't you tame more than one thing? You're useless. And they're like, beast tamers can't tame more than one thing. We talk about. And they're like, wait, no, Ryan tamed tons of things at the same time. How can you not do that? So yeah, you you quickly find out that Ryan's very special. So your thoughts on um, just basically cute girls beating up stuff is really what's about. pretty much um, <laughs> <laughs> cute cat girl and dragon girl and elf girl and fox girl and fairy girls. I, I, I actually uh, enjoyed this show. Um, it, it, it is goofy. Um, I I kind of love the idea that what they kind of got into with this is and, and I wish that they had fleshed it out more. But for what I got and maybe this is something that they they'll get more into later on um, is the aspect of with uh, with rain uh, in the hero party. The hero party is like Andrew had mentioned. They're they're really pretty much very nasty, um, and that centers around the hero himself. Um, him not not being able to accept the fact that uh, at, at first he just thought Rain was useless. Eventually, he become he becomes uh, almost obsessed with the idea that Rain um, may actually be more powerful than him. And at some point that becomes just the ultimate obsession of his. And he almost can't can't move forward. Uh, and and I think that that's an interesting aspect that they well, kind of imply that the hero has unique skill that allows him to never have a cap. Right. So and, essentially he could eventually get more that, powerful than rain rain. And that 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 becomes kind of the central aspect of the hero party. And, and that's off to the side. While Rain is slowly uh, gaining more and more of these uh, these girls in his quote unquote party, at wh- what he's actually doing is just taming all these girls. Um, it keeps coming up as a kind of a side subject of, well, now now the hero is, is frustrated because he's done this, and oh well, now the the hero is, is frustrated because now he's done this, and eventually that all. Uh, culminates in this this the last arc which i I don't want to dig too much into the spoiler aspect of it it all comes to a head where the hero is effectively attacking rain specifically and that is an interesting build up as this goes along and i i do hope that they we get more of this to actually see an ultimate into that um that interplay um, but as it stands, it, it, it's just generally a very enjoyable show. I, I really liked uh, Rain. He's a great character. I, I like a lot of the girls. They're some are goofy, some are sweet, some are um, absolute sunetes all the way through. So yeah, I had a lot of fun. I and I would really, really love to see the 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 future of the interplay between Rain and the Hero Party. I think overall, I I, I found the show very enjoyable, and it, it was really kind of just around. Canada, Tanya, and all them. I just, it was just kind of one of those cute shows. And I, it was kind of surprising how much the the girls in the series kind of carried the show for me because honestly, I didn't like Rain. <laughs> I think he was kind of just, I, I I think it's more of an aspect of a culmination of disappointments it, with Rain and the, and the Heroes Party that ultimately in the end made me just enjoy the show because of the girls. Because with Rain, he's just kind of, he's so bare bones like he's literally just he's nice so what 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 kind of character arcs does he have he's nice um did he have any kind of like suffering or something um kind of implies that he's dreading over the fact that he got kicked out of the party and that makes him feel inadequate and every now and then he stutters and they go rain let's go and he goes oh, okay and then he picks up again that's literally rain that's that's all of his character i i was a little bit disappointed i was hoping that because early on it like goes, okay, he makes a pact with Kanade. And as a beast tamer in typical games and video games and MMOs and everything that you have a beast tamer character, what do they do? They send their tames out to fight. So I thought it was going to be this thing where, you know, he's he's taming these and he's sending Kanade out. And t- no, literally the moment that he realized that he has like 
gain physical attributes from Kanade, he just goes out himself and leaves Kanade behind, which, yes, is to his nice guy attitude that, oh, no, I don't want her to get in trouble and, and get harmed. I'll go. But it, it still feels like, why do, you ha- why do we have to have the aspect of every character he tames, he gains something from it? Because then it makes it makes the girl useless. It makes, it makes the girl's uniqueness di- not there. If Tanya is a super amazing offensive caster, why give Shroud the ability to do that? Because then no long- Tanya is no longer unique. And that happens with every one of the girls he gets. He gets a girl, they have unique abilities, and then he gets it so they don't make them unique anymore. And again, that was another disappointment they kind of throw in there. Plus, most of the stuff that he resolves is through using paralyzing bees every single time, it seems like. <laughs> he did did use the paralyzing bees a lot. Um, and then, like I said, the whole hero's party aspect was a disappointment. I, I mean, yes, sure, they might be doing something interesting with the hero himself, but I almost felt like they could have done something cool with the other ones. Like, make them have doubts. Make them... The, the only one that sort of showed a hint of doubt was the healer. Everybody else is just like... Yeah, they're all dirt dirt bags. Like, just have at least one of them go. I think the only one that really kind of pushed back a little bit was the warrior, the big guy. Like, at some point, he's like, look, I know we don't like each other, but let's work together. It's like, bingo. At least one of them has something besides an evil derpy face going, ha, it's shroud. Yeah, we don't need you. No, acknowledge that he did help you and just deal with it. You need each other. Just deal with it. Um, And that kind of frustrated me. Yeah, I agree. I, I, because when you had mentioned the the priest, I I, I immediately thought of the warrior too. They, I mean, those those are the only those two seemed like they were kind of questioning whether or not they had done the right thing at some point during the show. And and I and, and that's what I was talking about with the hero party. I think that that was easily probably the most interesting aspect of this story. And it, and and I, I I like that it was in the background as something that constantly is being brought up again because it. It, it, it's it's the starting point of the story and you kind of want it to be an interesting aspect where you you kind of want it to at least at some point and that's why i said i i do want more of the story the story i want to see a ultimate solution to that of well does rain ultimately take over the hero's party do, do they eventually say okay obviously you have gone down the dark path Rain did not go down the dark path. We want to do what the hero party is ultimately supposed to do and and uh, finish off the the demon lord. And it you're so obsessed with Rain. I mean, we, we we're not getting anywhere. And it was interesting that they actually brought up a reason why technically the hero has to take on the demon lord. Again, that was that they have to do with that skill. He's like, look, the hero has a unique ability that allows him to have no limits. And that's required to beat the demon lord. I just literally don't have it. Yeah, Randy, you're going to say, well, Rain's gotten tons of abilities from all these girls. He's probably going to find some way of unlocking infinite skills or something like that. But it at least kind of presented something. I, I just felt a little disappointed in the idea that what it turned down to, what it, what it came down to was what was the ultimate re-clashing of Ryan with everybody else? Fight, proves that he's super OP, and then they go, oh, we got defeated. Well, we're still dirtbags. <laughs> do something with this besides have it just like rain beats him up and shows how OP he is. Um, again, just, just, just disappointments. But in the end, I, like I said, I, I still enjoyed all the girls. Um, uh, they were, they were fun. They were interesting. And in the end, it was just, just a little fun, cute, tame girls party. And Tanya is, is a Stafo, So that's great too. And cat girls. I, you give me a cat girl in a show. I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy it. And kind of day was a cat girl. So, we need more cat girls in shows. And if I have to watch Beast Tamer to get a cat girl, I'll watch Beast Tamer to get a cat girl. Anyways, that's Beast Tamer. Check that out if if you're interested. And I think we're going to call it there. This will be the first part. I think we're going to be doing two total parts of the fall 2022 anime season reviews. So check back next week for part two of the series of reviews. Again, as usual, we thank you guys for listening. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. As per usual, again, we're at TakuSpear.com. That's where you can go for all our links, social media links, ways to support the channel. Greatly appreciate everybody that supports us. And we hope you guys enjoyed this review. And you all take care. Os.